What's the Use of Poetry? by Richard Le Gallienne. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Craig Franklin. Sonia. Thomas Peter and jason in canada what's the use of poetry and idly tuneful the loquacious throng flutter and twitter prodigal of time and little masters make a toy of song till grave men weary of the sound of rhyme william watson in wordsworth's grave there is no doubt that many one might almost say most people are firmly convinced that they do not care for poetry they have no use for it they tell you either it bores them as a fantastic high-flown method of saying something that to their way of thinking could be better said in plain prose or they look upon it as the sentimental nonsense of the moonstruck and lovesick young a kind of intellectual candy all very well for women and children but of no value to grown men with the serious work of the world on their shoulders it is not at all difficult to account for and indeed to sympathize with this attitude to begin with of course there is a large class outside our present considerations which does not care for poetry simply because it does not care for any literature whatsoever serious reading of any kind does not enter into its scheme of life beyond the newspapers and magazines and an occasional novel of the hour idly taken up and indifferently put aside it has no literary needs with this listless multitude we have not to concern ourselves but rather with that sufficiently heterogeneous body known as the reading public the people for whom mr carnegie builds libraries and the publishers display their wares of course among these there must necessarily be considerable percentage temperamentally unappreciative of poetry just as there are numbers of people born with no ear for music and numbers again born with no colour sense the lover of poetry is no less born than the poet himself yet as the poet is made as well as born so is his reader and there are many who really love poetry without knowing it but who think they do not care for it either because they have contracted the wrong notion of what poetry is or because they have some time or other made a bad start with the wrong kind I am convinced that one widespread provocative of the prevailing impression of the foolishness of poetry is the mediocre magazine verse of the day. In an age when we go so much to the magazines for our reading, we may rely on finding there the best work being done in every branch of literature except the highest. The best novelists, the best historians, and the best essayists write for the magazines, but the best poets must be looked for in their high-priced volumes, and a magazine reader must rely for his verse on lady amateurs and tuneful college boys. Thus he too often approaches poetry not through the great masters but through the little misses, and he forms his naturally contemptuous notion of poetry from feeble echoes and insipid imitations. No wonder, therefore, that he should refuse to waste his good eyesight on anything in the shape of verse, and should conceive of poetry as a mild mental dissipation for young ladies, a sickly sweetmeat made of molasses and moonshine. If the magazine editors of the world would only bind themselves to publish no verse except the best, and, failing to obtain a contemporary supply of the best, would fill their spare corners of space with reprints of the old fine things, I am convinced that they would do a great deal toward rectifying this widespread misconception of an art which, far from being trivial and superficial, is, of all the arts, the most serious and most vitally human. I am not saying that all poetry is for all readers. There is a section of poetry which has been called Poet's Poetry, which of necessity can appeal only to those in whom the sense of beauty and verbal exquisiteness has become specialised. Spencer and Keats, for example, are poets of the rainbow. For the average reader, their poems are the luxuries rather than the necessities of literature, though in making a distinction so rough and ready it must not be forgotten that beauty 
happily is becoming more and more a general necessity nor must it be forgotten either that rainbows refined and remote as they are belong also to the realities it is the reality of poetry that i wish if possible to bring home to readers in this article some flowers says george meredith have roots deep as oaks poetry is one of those flowers and instead of its being a superficial decoration of life it is rightly understood the organic expression of life's deepest meaning the essence in words of human dreams and human action it is the truth of life told beautifully and yet truthfully there is only one basis for the longevity of human forms that basis is reality no other form of human expression has continued with such persistent survival from the beginning until now as poetry from the iliad to the absent-minded beggar it and the wild flowers for all their adventurous fragility are as old and no less stable than the hills and for the same reason because they are no less real the world is apt to credit prose with a greater reality than poetry but the truth is that the prose of life is real only in proportion as it is vitalized by the spirit of poetry that breathes in all created things life exacts practical reasons for the survival of all its forms of expression and unless poetry served some practical purpose of existence it would long since have perished it is because poetry has a practical work to do in the world that it continues and will continue to exist because it is one of the motive forces of the universe life's motive meaning one might almost say the nerve force of existence a great man has defined it as the finer spirit of all knowledge and the phrase though limited may help us to a broader and deeper apprehension of poetry and help us to say too that poetry is the finer spirit of all impulse the finer meaning of all achievement there is no human interest desiring to be displayed in all its essential vividness that does not realize the value of a poetical expression those who would depreciate the power of poetry in the sternest practical affairs have only to be reminded how much modern imperialism owes to rudyard kipling and it is by no means trivial to remark that the most successful advertisements have been in verse so soon as poetry so-called really is poetry its appeal is immediately admitted and its force undeniably felt it is the false poets who account for the false ideas of poetry one has only to confront a practical man with the real thing to convince him that without realizing it he has cared a great deal about poetry all his life probably he has imagined that this great stumbling block has been the verse why not say it in plain english he has impatiently exclaimed thinking all the time of bad verse of lifeless contorted rhyming and of those metrical inanities of the magazines and yet when you bring him a verse that is really alive in which the meter is felt to be the very life-beat of the thought you don't find him asking to have it turned into prose how about mandalay in prose for example or that old bugle call of scots sound sound the clarion fill the fife to all the sensual world proclaim one crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name or tennyson's tears idle tears or coleridge's he prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small for the dear god who loveth us he made and loveth all or the quality of mercy is not strained or under the greenwood tree or mr swinburne's ask nothing more of me sweet all i can give you i give heart of my heart were it more more would be laid at your feet love that should help you to live song that should spur you to soar in all these cases the verse is immediately felt to be the very life of the expression 
for the reason that it echoes in words the life rhythms to which unconsciously all such human emotions keep time say it in prose can you say a trumpet in prose or a tear or a butterfly if you can your prose is really poetry and will be found to be eloquent with sunken rhythms not immediately obvious to the ear and eye the first thing to realize about poetry is that the meter is the meaning even more than the words in tennyson's sad tears idle tears for example it is not so much the words that are accountable for the wistful sorrow of the general effect as the sad rain-like melody mysteriously charging the words with sorrow like some beautiful interpretative voice and it is this subtly mimetic quality endlessly adaptable which is the raison d'etre of metre and the secret of its power over mankind perhaps it may help us to attempt here a definition of poetry though it is a bold even foolhardy thing to do for there has never yet been a definition of poetry that satisfied any one but the man who made it we may recall one fashionable in its day matthew arnold's poetry is a criticism of life that a poet should have made such a harrowing definition is amazing though one of course understands it in the light of the fact that the inspiration of matthew arnold's muse was almost entirely that of a philosophical criticism of life far from being a criticism of life poetry is much more like a recreation of it it is life in words but let me timidly launch my own definition poetry is that impassioned arrangement of words whether in verse or prose which embodies the exaltation the beauty the rhythm and the pathetic truth of life there is a motive idealism behind all human action of which most of us are unconscious or to which we ordinarily give but little thought a romance of impulse which is the real significance of human effort the walls of thebes were built to music according to the old story but so were the walls of every other city that has ever been built the skyscrapers of new york are soaring to music also a masterful music of the future which not all can hear and of which perhaps the music makers themselves are most ignorant of all once more in emerson's immortal phrase the builders are building better than they know these ruthless speculators and stern businessmen who are the last to suspect themselves of the poetry which they involuntarily serve human life in the main is thus unconsciously poetical and moves to immortal measures of a mysterious spiritual music it is this impassioned exaltation this strange rhythm this spiritual beauty the finer spirit of life which the poet seizes on and expresses and therewith also that pathos which seems to inhere in all created things we read him because he gives that value of life which we feel belongs to it but for which we are unable to find the words ourselves how often one has heard people say on reading a poem why that is just what i have always felt but could never express and the exclamation was obviously a recognition of the truth of the poem the poet had made a true observation and recorded it with all the vividness of truth it is the business of the poet to be all the time thus recording and recreating life in all its manifestations not only for those who already possess something of the poetic vision yet lack the poetic utterance but also for those who need to be awakened to the ideal meanings and issues of life poetry is thus seen to be a kind of lay religion revealing and interpreting the varied beauty and nobility of life but a better way than theorizing to show the use the sweet uses of poetry is to call up the names of some of the great poets and ponder what they have meant and still mean in the life of humanity dante milton and wordsworth for example and to them we might add tennyson browning and matthew arnold how much these six poets alone have meant to the graver life of humanity the life of religion of thought of conduct particularly with regard to the four poets of the last century we are compelled to note how far more than any professed teachers and thinkers 
they were the teachers and thinkers of their age and did indeed mould the thought of their century for how many have wordsworth's prelude tennyson's in memoriam browning's rabbi ben ezra and matthew arnold's empedocles been literally sacred books books of daily exercise and meditation to name only a few of their more typical poems they are well worn today but think what forces in the world these lines of wordsworth have been the world is too much with us late and soon getting and spending we lay waste our powers little we see in nature that is ours we have given our hearts away a sordid boon tennyson says a god in nature than at strife that nature lends such evil dreams so careful of the type she seems so careless of the single life that i considering everywhere her secret meaning in her deeds and finding that of fifty seeds she often brings but one to bear i falter where i firmly trod and falling with my weight of cares upon the great world's altar stairs that slope through darkness up to god i stretch lame hands of faith and grope and gather dust and chaff and call to what i feel is lord of all and faintly trust the larger hope i quote this from matthew arnold it is so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun to have lived light in the spring to have loved to have thought to have done to have advanced true friends and beat down baffling foes that we must feign a bliss of doubtful future date and while we dream on this lose all our present state and relegate to worlds yet distant our repose these lines and many more like them that one could quote have done definite spiritual service for mankind have inspired countless men and women with new faith new hope and new fortitude and will remain permanent springs of sustenance for the human spirit again the mere mention of such names as goethe byron and shelley carries with it their tremendous significance in the practical life of the modern world when we think of such figures as occur over and over again in the history of poetry we realize that tennyson's one poor poet's scroll that shook the world was no mere boyish inflation of the poet's mission that sad musical poet arthur o'shaughnessy said no more than the truth when he sang in verse like the motion of moonlight on water we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever it seems to realize what a sheerly political force poetry has been in america alone one has only to recall the poems of whittier and lowell poe and longfellow and julia ward howe's immortal battle hymn of the republic but apart from such strenuous and stern services how many other services no less valuable has poetry rendered to mankind services of joy and universal sympathy the poet often so sad himself sings all men's joys and sorrows as if they were his own and there's nothing that can happen to us nothing we can experience no stroke of fate and no mood of heart or mind that we cannot find expressed and interpreted for us somewhere in some poet's book take but one poet robert burns for instance and think of the immense addition to the sum total of human pleasure and human consolation that his handful of scotch songs has made who asks what's the use of poetry when he joins in old lang syne and feels his heart stirred to its tearful depths with the sentiment of human brotherhood and the almost tragic dearness of friends and who that has ever been in love has not once in his life felt the brotherly hand of a fellow experience in had we never loved say kindly had we never loved say blindly never met or never parted we had ne'er been broken-hearted and been consoled somehow with that mysterious consolation which belongs to the perfect expression of sorrow if the simple songs of a scotch peasant have been of so much use to the world what of that lordly pleasure-house of shakespeare 
think of the boundless universe of mere delight that has written over its door the works of shakespeare the laughter the wisdom the beauty the all-comprehending humanity if it be of no use to make men happy to quicken in them the joy of life to heighten their pleasures to dry their tears to bind up their wounds if it be of no use to teach them wisdom to open their eyes to purify and direct their spirits to gird them to fight to brace them to endure to teach them to be gentle then indeed we may ask what's the use of poetry but while poetry can do all these things i think it must be allowed by the most practical that it has a very important part to play in the work of the world to end as i began with that practical man who imagines that he does not care for poetry i gave one or two explanations of his distaste but there is one other important one that must not be forgotten he begins too often with paradise lost i mean that he too often attempts some tough classic before he is ready for it and because he cannot read milton with pleasure imagines that he does not care for poetry at all thus he finds himself bewildered by the insipid magazine muses on the one hand and the unscalable immortals on the other too many make the famous mr boffin's mistake of beginning the study of english literature with gibbon's decline and fall and what wonder if a man beginning the study of english poetry with browning's sordello should imagine like douglas gerald in the story either that his mind was failing him or that there was something radically wrong with the poet actually a man may love poetry very deeply and care nothing at all for paradise lost he may also find nothing for him in homer or aeschylus or dante or goethe the great architectural works of such masters may seem too godlike and grim for his gentler human need but give him a handful of violets from ophelia's grave or a bunch of herrick's daffodils or take him out under the sky where shelley's lark is singing or try him with a lyric of heinz or some ballad of uh, old unhappy far-off things and battles long ago and you will see whether or not he loves poetry the mistake is in thinking that all poetry is for all readers on the contrary the realm of poetry is as wide as the world for the very reason that each man may find there just what he needs and leave the rest the thing is to discover the poetry that was meant for us and perhaps the best way to do that is to turn over the pages of some well-made selection and see where our eyes yet caught and held palgrave's golden treasury is of course the classical anthology a little volume filled with the purest gold of english lyrical poetry footnote the golden treasury when it was published more than forty years ago was certainly the finest anthology that had been made in england and it still holds its place as a very choice collection of british poets small and select End of footnote. if a man should read in that for an hour and find nothing to his taste it is to be feared that he was born deaf to the sweet rippling of the pierian spring but as i have said i believe that few have been so hardly treated by nature a poet died young in every one of us said some one i think he did not so much die as fall asleep nor is he so fast asleep but that the right song sung right would awaken him what is the use of poetry it is just the whole use of living and let any one who doubts it enter the garden for himself i come ye hither to this pleasant land for here in truth are vines of engadi here golden urns of manna to thy hand and rocks whence honey flows deliciously udders from which comes frothing copiously the milk of life ears filled with sweetest grains and fig trees knowing no sterility here paradisal streams make rich the plains 
oh come and bathe therein ye world-worn weary swains richard lee gallien end of what's the use of poetry by richard lee gallien this recording is in the public domain to the spring from hymns of astria in acrostic verse by sir john davis from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by craig franklin to the spring earth now is green and heaven is blue lively spring which makes all new Ioli spring doth enter, jolly spring doth enter, sweet young sun beams do subdue, angry aged winter. Blasts are mild, and seas are calm, every meadow flows with balm, the earth wears all her riches, harmonious birds sing such a psalm as ear and heart bewitches. Reserve, sweet spring, this nymph of ours, eternal garlands of thy flowers, Green garlands never wasting, in her shall last our state's fair spring, now and for ever flourishing, as long as heaven is lasting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Mary Stuart by Pierre de Ronsard, translated from the French by Louise Stuart Costello from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens to mary stuart all beauty granted as a boon to earth that is has been or ever can have birth compared to hers is void and nature's care ne'er formed a creature so divinely fair in spring amidst the lilies she was born and purer tints her peerless face adorn and though adonis blood the rose may paint beside her bloom the rose's hues are faint with all his richest store love decked her eyes the graces each those daughters of the skies strove which should make her to the world's most dear and to attend her left their native sphere the day that was to bear her far away why was i mortal to behold that day oh had i senseless grown nor heard nor seen or that my eyes a ceaseless fount had been that i might weep as weep amidst their bowers the nymphs when winter winds have cropped their flowers or when rude torrents the clear streams deform or when the trees are riven by the storm or rather would I some bird had been, still to be near her in each changing scene, still on the highest mast to watch all day, and like a star to mark her vessel's way. The dangerous billows passed, on shore, on sea, near that dear face it still were mine to be. O oh, France, where are thy ancient champions gone? Roland, Rinaldo, is there living none? Her steps to follow and her safety guard and deem her lovely looks their best reward which might subdue the pride of mighty jove to leave his heaven and languish for her love no fault is hers but in her royal state for simple love dreads to approach the great he flies from regal pomp that treacherous snare where truth unmarked may wither in despair wherever destiny her path may lead fresh springing flowers will bloom beneath her tread all nature will rejoice the waves be bright the tempest check its fury at her sight the sea be calm a beauty to behold the sun shall crown her with his rays of gold unless he fears should he approach her throne her majesty should quite eclipse his own end of poem this recording is in the public domain. To the Lord General Cromwell by John Milton 
from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by jason in canada to the lord general cromwell cromwell our chief of men who through a cloud not of war only but detractions rude guided by faith and matchless fortitude to peace and truth thy glorious way hast ploughed and on the neck of crowned fortune proud hast reared god's trophies and his work pursued while darwen stream with blood of scots imbued and dunbar field resounds thy praises loud and worcester's laureate wreath yet much remains to conquer still peace hath her victories no less renowned than war new foes arise threatening to bind our souls with secular chains help us to save free conscience from the paw of hireling wolves whose gospel is their maw milton end of poem this recording is in the public domain o oh, breathe not his name robert emmet by thomas moore from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by sonia o oh, breathe not his name robert emmet o oh, breathe not his name let it sleep in the shade where cold and unhonoured his relics are laid sad silent and dark be the tears that we shed as the night dew that falls on the grave over his head but the night dew that falls though in silence it weeps shall brighten with verdure the grave where he sleeps and the tear that we shed though in secret it rolls shall long keep his memory green in our souls end of poem this recording is in the public domain charles the twelfth from the vanity of human wishes by dr samuel johnson from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by sonia charles the twelfth from the vanity of human wishes on what foundation stands the warrior's pride how just his hopes let swedish charles decide a frame of adamant a soul of fire no dangers fright him and no labours tire over love over fear extends his wide domain unconquered lord of pleasure and of pain no joys to him pacific sceptres yield war sounds the trump he rushes to the field behold surrounding kings their power combine and one capitulate and one resign peace courts his hand but spreads her charms in vain think nothing gained he cries till naught remain on moscow's walls till gothic standards fly and all be mine beneath the polar sky the march begins in military state and nations on his eye suspended wait stern famine guards the solitary coast and winter barricades the realms of frost he comes nor want nor cold his course delay hide blushing glory hide poltova's day the vanquished hero leaves his broken bands and shows his misery in distant lands condemned a needy supplicant to wait while ladies interpose and slaves debate but did not chance at length her error mend did not subverted empire mark his end did rival monarchs give the fatal wound or hostile millions press him to the ground his fall was destined to a barren strand a petty fortress and a dubious hand he left the name at which the world grew pale to point a moral or adorn a tale end of poem this recording is in the public domain napoleon by victor hugo Translated from the French by Fraser's Magazine From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Napoleon 
te donner notre âge, ange ou démon, qu'importe. Angel or demon, thou, whether of light, the minister, or darkness, still dost sway this age of ours. Thine eagle soaring flight bears us, all breathless, after it, away. The eye that from thy presence fain would stray shuns thee in vain. Thy mighty shadow throne rests on all pictures of the living day, and on the threshold of our time alone, dazzling yet sombre, stands thy form, Napoleon. Thus, when the admiring stranger's steps explore the subject lands that neath Vesuvius be, whether he wind along the enchanting shore to Portici from fair Parthenope, or lingering long in dreamy reverie, or loveliest Ischia's odorous isle he stray, wood by whose breath the soft and amorous sea seems like some languishing sultana's lay, a voice for very sweets that scarce can win its way, him, whether Pistum solemn fain detain, shrouding his soul with meditation's power, or at Pozzuoli to the sprightly strain of Tarantella dance near Tuscan tower, listening he while away the evening hour, or wake the echoes, mournful, lone, and deep, of that sad city in its dreaming bower by the volcano seized, where mansions keep the likeness which they wore at that last fatal sleep. Or be his bark at Posilippo laid, while as the swarthy boatman at his side chants Tasso's lays to Virgil's pleased shade, ever he sees throughout that circuit wide, from shaded nook or sunny lawn espied, from rocky headland viewed, or flowery shore, from sea and spreading mead alike descried, the giant mount, towering all objects o'er, and blackening with its breath the horizon evermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Napoleon from Child Harold, Canto Three by Lord Byron. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Seven, Descriptive and Narrative, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Napoleon. There sunk the greatest, nor the worst of men, Whose spirit, antithetically mixed, One moment of the mightiest, and again, On little objects with like firmness fixed, Extreme in all things hadst thou been betwixt. Thy throne had still been thine, or never been, For daring made thy rise as fall, Thou seekest even now to reassume the imperial mien, And shake again the world, the thunderer of the scene. Conqueror and captive of the earth art thou. She trembles at thee still, and thy wild name was ne'er more bruited in men's minds than now, that thou art nothing save the jest of fame, who wooed thee once thy vassal and became the flatterer of thy fierceness, till thou wert a god unto thyself, nor less the same. To the astounded kingdoms all inert, Who deemed thee for a time whate'er thou didst assert. O more or less than man in high or low, Battling with nations flying from the field, Now making monarchs necks thy footstool now, More than thy meanest soldiers taught to yield, An empire thou couldst crush, command, rebuild, but govern not thy pettiest passion, nor, however deeply, in men's spirits skilled, look through thine own, nor curb the lust of war, nor learn that tempted fate will leave the loftiest star. Yet well thy soul hath brooked the turning tide, with that untaught innate philosophy, which, be it wisdom, coldness, or deep pride, is gall and wormwood to an enemy. When the whole host of hatred stood hard by to watch and mock thee shrinking, thou hadst smiled with a sedate and all enduring eye. When fortune fled her spoiled and favourite child, he stood unbowed beneath the ills upon him piled. 
sager than in thy fortunes for in them ambition steal thee on too far to show that just habitual scorn which could contemn men and their thoughts twas wise to feel not so to wear it ever on thy lip and brow and spurn the instruments thou wert to use till they were turning unto thine overthrow tis but a worthless world to win or lose so hath it proved to thee and all such lot who choose if like a tower upon a headlong rock thou hadst been made to stand or fall alone such scorn of man had helped to brave the shock but men's thoughts were the steps which paved thy throne their admiration thy best weapon shone the part of philip's son was thine not then unless aside thy purple had been thrown like stern diogenes to mock at men for sceptred cynics earth were far too wide a den but quiet to quick bosoms is a hell and there hath been thy bane there is a fire and motion of the soul which will not dwell in its own narrow being but aspire beyond the fitting medium of desire and but one kindled quenchless evermore preys upon high adventure nor can tire of aught but rest a fever at the core fatal to him who bears to all who ever bore this makes the madmen who have made men mad by their contagion conquerors and kings founders of sects and systems to whom adds sophists bards statesmen all unquiet things which stir too strongly the soul's secret springs and are themselves the fools to those they fool envied yet how unenviable what stings are theirs one breast laid open were a school which would unteach mankind the lust to shine or rule their breath is agitation and their life a storm whereon they ride to sink at last and yet so nursed and bigoted to strife that should their days surviving perils past melt to calm twilight they feel overcast with sorrow and supiness and so die even as a flame unfed which runs to waste with its own flickering or a sword laid by which eats into itself and rusts ingloriously he who ascends to mountain tops shall find the loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow he who surpasses or subdues mankind must look down on the hate of those below though high above the sun of glory glow and far beneath the earth and ocean spread round him are icy rocks and loudly blow contending tempests on his naked head and thus reward the toils which to those summits led end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the monument erected to mazzini at genoa by algernon charles swinburne from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by sonia on the monument erected to mazzini at genoa italia mother of the souls of men mother divine of all that served thee best with sword or pen all sons of thine thou knowest that here the likeness of the best before thee stands the head most high the heart found faithfulest the purest hands above the fume and foam of time that flits the soul we know now sits on high where alighieri sits with angelo nor his own heavenly tongue hath heavenly speech enough to say what this man was whose praise no thought may reach no words can weigh since man's first mother brought to mortal birth her first-born son such grace befell not ever man on earth as crowns this one of god nor man was ever this thing said that he could give life back to her who gave him that his dead mother might live but this man found his mother dead and slain with fast sealed eyes and bade the dead rise up and live again and she did rise 
and all the world was bright with her through him but dark with strife like heaven's own sun that storming clouds bedim was all his life life and the clouds are vanished hate and fear have had their span of time to hurt and are not he is here the sun like man city superb that hadst columbus first for sovereign son be prouder that thy breast hath later nursed this mightier one glory be his forever while this land lives and is free as with controlling breath and sovereign hand he bade her be earth shows to heaven the names by thousands told that crown her fame but highest of all that heaven and earth behold mazzini's name end of poem this recording is in the public domain george washington by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens george washington by broad potomac's silent shore better than trajan lowly lies gilding her green declivities with glory now and evermore art to his fame no aid hath lent his country is his monument end of poem this recording is in the public domain washington by james russell lowell from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter washington from under the elm read at cambridge july the third eighteen seventy five on the hundredth anniversary of washington's taking command of the american army beneath our consecrated elm a century ago he stood famed vaguely for that old fight in the wood which redly foamed round him but could not overwhelm the life foredoomed to wield our rough-hewn helm from colleges where now the gown to arms had yielded from the town our rude self-summoned levies flocked to see the new-come chiefs and wonder which was he no need to question long close-lipped and tall long trained in murder brooding forests lone to bridle others clamours and his own from the erect he towered above them all the incarnate discipline that was to free with iron curb that armed democracy haughty they said he was at first severe but owned as all men owned the steady hand upon the bridle patient to command prized as all prize the justice pure from fear and learned to honour first then love him then revere such power there is in clear-eyed self-restraint and purpose clean as light from every selfish taint musing beneath the legendary tree the years between furl off i seem to see the sun-flecks shaken the stirred foliage through dapple with gold his sober buff and blue and weave prophetic aureoles round the head that shines our beacon now nor darkens with the dead o man of silent mood a stranger among strangers then how art thou since renowned the great the good familiar as the day in all the homes of men the winged years that win no praise and blame blow many names out they but fan to flame the self-renewing splendours of thy fame oh for a drop of that terse roman zinc who gave agricola dateless length of days to celebrate him fitly neither swerve to phrase unkempt nor past discretion's brink with him so statue-like in sad reserve so diffident to claim so forward to deserve nor need i shun due influence of his fame who mortal among mortals seemed as now the equestrian shape with unimpassioned brow that paces silent on through vistas of acclaim what figure more immovably august than that grave strength so patient and so pure calm in good fortune when it wavered sure 
that soul serene impenetrably just modelled on classic lines so simple they endure that soul so softly radiant and so white the track it left seems less of fire than light cold but to such as love distemperature and if pure light as some deem be the force that drives rejoicing planets on their course why for his power benign seek an impure source his was the true enthusiasm that burns long domestically bright fed from itself and shy of human sight the hidden force that makes a lifetime strong and not the short-lived fuel of a song passionless say you what is passion for but to sublime our natures and control to front heroic toils with late return or none or such as shames the conqueror that fire was fed with substance of the soul and not with holiday stubble that could burn through seven slow years of unadvancing war equal when fields were lost or fields were won with breath of popular applause or blame nor fanned nor damped unquenchably the same too inward to be reached by flaws of idle fame soldier and statesman rarest unison high poised example of great duties done simply as breathing the world's honours worn as life's indifferent gifts to all men born dumb for himself unless it were to god but for his barefoot soldiers eloquent tramping the snow to coral where they trod held by his awe and hollow-eyed content modest yet firm as nature's self unblamed save by the men his nobler temper shamed not honoured then or now because he wooed the popular voice but that he still withstood broad-minded higher-souled there is but one who was all this and ours and all men's washington mind strong by fits irregularly great that flash and darken like revolving lights catch more the vulgar eye unschooled to wait on the long curve of patient days and nights rounding the whole life to the circle fair of orbed completeness and this balanced soul so simple in its grandeur coldly bare of drapery theatric standing there in perfect symmetry of self-control seems not so great at first but greater grows still as we look and by experience learn how grand this quiet is how nobly stern the discipline that wrought through lifelong throes this energetic passion of repose a nature too decorous and severe too self-respectful in its griefs and joys for ardent girls and boys who find no genius in a mind so clear that its grave depths seem obvious and near nor a soul great that made so little noise they feel no force in that calm cadenced phrase the habitual full dress of his well-bred mind that seems to pace the minuet's courtly maze and tell of ampler leisures roomier length of days his broad-built brain to self so little kind that no tumultuary blood could blind form to control men not amaze looms not like those that borrow height of haze it was a world of statelier movement then than this we fretten he a denizen of that ideal rome that made a man for men placid completeness life without a fall from faith our highest aims truth's breachless wall surely if any fame can bear the touch his will say here at the last trumpet's call the unexpressive man whose life expressed so much end of poem this recording is in the public domain daniel webster by oliver wendell holmes from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin Daniel Webster When stricken by the freezing blast, a nation's living pillars fall. How rich the storied page, how vast a word a whisper can recall. No medal lifts its fretted face, 
nor speaking marble cheats your eye yet while these pictured lines i trace a living image passes by a roof beneath the mountain pines the cloisters of a hill-girt plain the front of life's embattled lines a mound beside the heaving main these are the scenes a boy appears set life's round dial in the sun count the swift arc of seventy years his frame is dust his task is done yet pause upon the noontide hour ere the declining sun has laid his bleaching rays on manhood's power and look upon the mighty shade no gloom that stately shape can hide no change uncrown his brow behold dark calm large fronted lightning eyed earth has no double from its mould ere from the fields by valour won the battle smoke had rolled away and bared the blood-red setting sun his eyes were opened on the day his land was but a shelving strip black with the strife that made it free he lived to see its banners dip their fringes in the western sea the boundless prairies learned his name his words the mountain echoes knew the northern breezes swept his fame from icy lake to warm bayou in toil he lived in peace he died when life's full cycle was complete put off his robes of power and pride and laid them at his master's feet his rest is by the storm-swept waves whom life's wild tempests roughly tried whose heart was like the streaming caves of ocean throbbing at his side death's cold white hand is like the snow laid softly on the furrowed hill it hides the broken seams below and leaves the summit brighter still in vain the envious tongue unbraids his name a nation's heart shall keep till morning's latest sunlight fades on the blue tablet of the deep end of poem this recording is in the public domain William Lloyd Garrison by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia William Lloyd Garrison Some time afterward it was reported to me by the city officers that they had ferreted out the paper and its editor, that his office was an obscure hole, his only visible auxiliary a negro boy, and his supporters a few very insignificant persons of all colour letter of h g otis in a small chamber friendless and unseen toiled over his types one poor unlearned young man the place was dark unfurnished and mean yet there the freedom of a race began help came but slowly surely no man yet put lever to the heavy world with less what need of help he knew how types were set he had a dauntless spirit and a press such earnest natures are the fiery pith the compact nucleus round which systems grow mass after mass becomes inspired therewith and worlds impregnate with the central glow o truth o freedom now are ye still born in the rude stable in the manger nursed what humble hands unbar those gates of morn through which the splendours of the new day burst what shall one monk scarce known beyond his cell front rome's far-reaching bolts and scorn her frown brave luther answered yes that thunder's swell rocked europe and discharmed the triple crown whatever can be known of earth we know sneered europe's wise men in their snail shells curled no said one man in genoa and that no out of the dark created this new world who is it will not dare himself to trust who is it hath not strength to stand alone who is it thwarts and bilks the inward must he and his works like sand from earth are blown men of a thousand shifts and wiles look here 
see one straightforward conscience put in pawn to win a world see the obedient sphere by bravery's simple gravitation drawn shall we not heed the lesson taught of old and by the present's lips repeated still in our own single manhood to be bold fortressed in conscience and impregnable will we stride the river daily at its spring nor in our childish thoughtlessness foresee what myriad vessel streams shall tribute bring how like an equal it shall greet the sea o oh, small beginnings ye are great and strong based on a faithful heart and weariless brain ye build the future fair ye conquer wrong ye earn the crown and wear it not in vain end of poem this recording is in the public domain henry ward beecher by charles henry phelps from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens henry ward beecher his tongue was touched with sacred fire he could not rest he must speak out when liberty lay stabbed and doubt stalked through the night in vestments dire when slaves uplifted manacled hands praying in agony and despair and answer came not anywhere but gloom through all the stricken lands his voice for freedom instant rang for shame he cried spare thou the rod all men are free before their god the dragon answered with its fang tis brave to face embrasured death hot belching from the cannon's mouth yet brave it is for north or south and truth to face the mob's mad breath so spake he then he and the few who prized their manhood more than praise their faith failed not of better days after the nights of bloody dew england's great heart misunderstood she looked upon her child askance but heard his words and lowered her lance remembering her motherhood majestic liberty serene thou frontest on the chaste white sea quench thou awhile thy torch for he lies dead on whom thou once did lean thy cause was ever his the slave in any fetters was his friend his warfare never knew an end wherever men lay bound he clave end of poem this recording is in the public domain abraham lincoln foully assassinated april fourteenth eighteen sixty five by tom taylor from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by jason in canada abraham lincoln foully assassinated april fourteenth eighteen sixty five footnote this tribute appeared in the London Punch, which, up to the time of the assassination of Mr. Lincoln, had ridiculed and maligned him with all its well-known powers of pen and pencil. End footnote. You lay a wreath on murdered Lincoln's beer, you, who with mocking pencil wont to trace, broad for the self-complacent British sneer, his length of shambling limb, his furrowed face, his gaunt, gnarled hands, his unkempt, bristling hair, his garb uncouth, his bearing ill at ease, his lack of all we prize as debonair, of power or will to shine, of art to please. You, whose smart pen backed up the pencil's laugh, judging each step as though the way were plain, reckless, so it could point its paragraph of chief's perplexity, or people's pain beside this corpse that bears for winding sheet the stars and stripes he lived to rear anew between the mourners at his head and feet say scurrile jester is there room for you yes he had lived to shame me from my sneer 
to lame my pencil and confute my pen to make me own this kind of prince's peer this rail splitter a true-born king of men my shallow judgment i had learned to rue noting how to occasion's height he rose how his quaint wit made home truth seem more true how iron-like his temper grew by blows how humble yet how hopeful he could be how in good fortune and in ill the same nor bitter in success nor boastful he thirsty for gold nor feverish for fame he went about his work such work as few ever had laid on head and heart and hand as one who knows where there's a task to do man's honest will must heaven's good grace command who trusts the strength will with the burden grow that god makes instruments to work his will if but that will we can arrive to know nor tamper with the weights of good and ill so he went forth to battle on the side that he felt clear was liberties and rights as in his peasant boyhood he had plied his warfare with rude nature's thwarting mites the uncleared forest the unbroken soil the iron bark that turns the lumberer's axe the rapid that o'erbears the boatman's toil the prairie hiding the mazed wanderer's tracks the ambushed indian and the prowling bear such were the deeds that helped his youth to train rough culture but such trees large fruit may bear if but their stock be of right girth and grain so he grew up a destined work to do and lived to do it four long-suffering years ill fate ill feeling ill report lived through and then he heard the hisses change to cheers the taunts to tribute the abuse to praise and took both with the same unwavering mood till as he came on light from darkling days and seemed to touch the goal from where he stood a felon hand between the goal and him reached from behind his back a trigger pressed and those perplexed and patient eyes were dim those gaunt long laboring limbs were laid to rest the words of mercy were upon his lips forgiveness in his heart and on his pen when this vile murderer brought swift eclipse to thoughts of peace on earth good will to men the old world and the new from sea to sea utter one voice of sympathy and shame sore heart so stopped when it at last beat high sad life cut short just as its triumph came a deed accursed strokes have been struck before by the assassin's hand whereof men doubt if more of horror or disgrace they bore but thy foul crime like cain's stands darkly out vile hand that brandest murder on a strife whate'er its grounds stoutly and nobly striven and with the martyr's crown crownest a life with much to praise little to be forgiven tom taylor end of poem this recording is in the public domain o captain my captain by walt whitman from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter o captain my captain o captain my captain our fearful trip is done the ship has weathered every wreck the prize we sought is won the port is near the bells i hear the people all exulting while follow eyes the steady keel the vessel grim and daring but o oh, heart 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 oh the bleeding drops of red where on the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead o oh, captain my captain rise up and hear the bells rise up for you the flag is flung for you the bugle trills for you bouquets and ribboned wreaths 
for you the shores a crowding for you they call the swaying mass their eager faces turning here captain dear father this arm beneath your head it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead my captain does not answer his lips are pale and still my father does not feel my arm he has no pulse nor will the ship is anchored safe and sound its voyage closed and done from fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object won exalt o shores and ring o bells but i with mournful tread walk the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Life Mask of Lincoln by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens On the Life Mask of Lincoln this bronze doth keep the very form and mould of our great martyr's face yet this is he that brow or wisdom or benignity that human humorous mouth those cheeks that hold like some harsh landscape all the summer's gold that spirit fit for sorrow as the sea for storms to beat on the lone agony those silent patient lips too well foretold yes this is he who ruled a world of men as might some prophet of the elder day brooding above the tempest and the fray with deep-eyed thought and more than mortal ken a power was his beyond the touch of art of armed strength his pure and mighty heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Hand of Lincoln by Edmund Clarence Stedman From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Hand of Lincoln Look on this cast, and know the hand that bore a nation in its hold. From this mute witness understand what Lincoln was, how large of mould the man who sped the woodman's team and deepest sunk the ploughman's share and pushed the laden raft a stream of fate before him unaware this was the hand that knew to swing the axe since thus would freedom train her son and made the forest ring and drove the wedge and toiled amain firm hand that loftier office took a conscious leader's will obeyed and when men sought his word and look with steadfast might the gathering swayed no courtiers toying with a sword nor minstrels laid across a lute a chief's uplifted to the lord when all the kings of earth were mute the hand of a knack sinewed strong the fingers on that greatness clutch yet lo the marks there lines along of one who strove and suffered much for here in knotted cord and vein i trace the varying chart of years i know the troubled heart the strain the weight of atlas and the tears again i see the patient brow that palm erewhile was wont to press and now tis furrowed deep and now made smooth with hope and tenderness for something of a formless grace this moulded outline plays about a pitying flame beyond our trace breathes like a spirit in and out the love that cast an aureole round one who longer to endure called mirth to ease his ceaseless dole yet kept his nobler purpose sure lo as i gaze the statured man built up from yon large hand appears a type that nature wills to plan but once in all a people's years 
What better than this voiceless cast to tell of such a one as he? Since through its living semblance passed the thought that bade a race be free. Edmund Clarence Stedman End of poem This recording is in the public domain. Abraham Lincoln from the Harvard Commemoration Ode, July the 21st, 1865, by James Russell Lowell. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Abraham Lincoln Life may be given in many ways, and loyalty to truth be sealed as bravely in the closet as the field so bountiful is fate but then to stand beside her when craven churls deride her to front a line in arms and not to yield this shows methinks god's plan and measure of a stalwart man limbed like the old heroic breeds who stand self-poised on manhood's solid earth not forced to frame excuses for his birth fed from within with all the strength he needs such was he our martyr chief whom late the nation he had led with ashes on her head wept with the passion of an angry grief forgive me if from present things i turn to speak what in my heart will beat and burn and hang my wreath on his world-honoured urn nature they say doth dote and cannot make a man save on some worn-out plan repeating us by rote for him her old world moulds aside he threw and choosing sweet clay from the breast of the unexhausted west with stuff untainted shaped a hero new wise steadfast in the strength of god and true how beautiful to see once more a shepherd of mankind indeed who loved his charge but never loved to lead one whose meek flock the people joyed to be not lured by any cheat of birth but by his clear-grained human worth and brave old wisdom of sincerity they knew that outward grace is dust they could not choose but trust in that sure-footed mind's unfaltering skill and supple tempered will that bent like perfect steel to spring again and thrust his was no lonely mountain peak of mind thrusting to thin air o'er our cloudy bars a sea mark now now lost in vapours blind broad prairie rather genial level lined fruitful and friendly for all humankind yet also nigh to heaven and loved of loftiest stars nothing of europe here or then of europe fronting mournwood still ere any names of serf and peer could nature's equal scheme deface here was a type of the true elder race and one of plutarch's men talked with us face to face i praise him not it were too late and some initiative weakness there must be in him who condescends to victory such as the present gives and cannot wait safe in himself as in a fate so always firmly he he knew to bide his time and can his fame abide still patient in his simple faith sublime till the wise years decide great captains with their guns and drums disturb our judgment for the hour but at last silence comes these all are gone and standing like a tower our children shall behold his fame the kindly earnest brave foreseeing man sagacious patient dreading praise not blame new birth of our new soil the first american end of poem this recording is in the public domain albert prince consort of england from idols of the king by Alfred Lord Tennyson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, 
Descriptive and Narrative Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Albert, Prince Consort of England. These to his memory, since he held them dear, perchance as finding there unconsciously some image of himself i dedicate i dedicate i consecrate with tears these ideals and indeed he seems to me scarce other than my own ideal king whose reverence his conscience as his king whose glory was redressing human wrong who spake no slander no nor listened to it who loved one only and who clave to her her over all whose realms to their last isle commingled with the gloom of imminent war the shadow of his loss moved like eclipse darkening the world we have lost him he is gone we know him now all narrow jealousies are silent and we see him as he moved how modest kindly all accomplished wise with what sublime repression of himself and in what limits and how tenderly not swaying to this faction or to that not making his high place the lawless perch of winged ambitions nor a vantage ground for pleasure but through all this tract of years wearing the white flower of a blameless life before a thousand peering littlenesses in that fierce light which beats upon a throne and blackens every blot for where is he who dares foreshadow for an only son a lovelier life a more unstained than his or how should england dreaming of his sons hope more for these than some inheritance of such a life a heart a mind as thine thou noble father of her kings to be laborious for her people and her poor voice in the rich dawn of an ampler day far-sighted summoner of war and waste to fruitful strifes and rivalries of peace sweet nature gilded by the gracious gleam of letters dear to science dear to art dear to thy land and ours a prince indeed beyond all titles and a household name hereafter through all times albert the good break not a woman's heart but still endure break not for thou art royal but endure remembering all the beauty of that star which shone so close beside thee that ye made one light together but has passed and left the crown of lonely splendour may all love his love unseen but felt o'ershadow thee the love of all thy sons encompass thee the love of all thy daughters cherish thee the love of all thy people comfort thee till god's love set thee at his side again end of poem this recording is in the public domain to virgil by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by sonia to virgil written at the request of the mantuans for the nineteenth centenary of virgil's death b c nineteen one roman virgil thou that singest ilion's lofty temples robed in fire ilion falling rome arising wars and filial faith and dido's pyre two landscape lover lord of language more than he that sang the works and days all the chosen coin of fancy flashing out from many a golden phrase three thou that singest wheat and woodland tilth and vineyard hive and horse and herd all the charm of all the muses often flowering in a lonely word four poet of the happy titirus piping underneath his beechen bowers poet of the poet's setter whom the laughing shepherd bound with flowers five chanter of the polio glorying in the blissful years again to be summers of the snakeless meadow unlaborious earth and all a sea six 
thou that seest universal nature moved by universal mind thou majestic in thy sadness at the doubtful doom of humankind seven light among the vanished ages star that gildest yet this phantom shore golden branch amid the shadows kings and realms that pass to rise no more eight now thy forum roars no longer fallen every purple caesar's dome though thine ocean roll of rhythm sound forever of imperial rome nine now the rome of slaves hath perished and the rome of freemen holds her place i from out the northern island sundered once from all the human race ten i salute thee mantovano i that love thee since my day began wielder of the stateliest measure ever moulded by the lips of man end of poem this recording is in the public domain In a copy of Omar Khayyam by James Russell Lowell, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. In copy of Omar Khayyam, these pearls of thought in Persian gulfs were bred, each softly loosened as a rounded moon. The diver Omar plucked them from their bed. Fitzgerald strung them on an English thread. Fit rosary for a queen in shape and hue, when contemplation tells her pensive beads of mortal thoughts for ever old and new. Fit for a queen? Why, surely then for you. The moral. When doubts eddies toss and twirl, faith slender shall up till her footing reel. Plunge. If you find not peace beneath the whirl, groping, you may like Omar grasp a pearl. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Madame de Sévigné, Playing Blind Man's Buff, by Monsieur de Montreuil, translated anonymously from the French. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. To Madame de Sévigny, Playing Blind Man's Buff You charm when you talk, walk, or move, still more on this day than another. When blinded, you're taken for love, when the bandage is off, for his mother. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. George Sand by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada George Sand True genius, but true woman, Dost deny thy woman's nature with a manly scorn, And break away the gods and armlets Worn by weaker women in captivity? ah vain denial that revolted cry is sobbed in by a woman's voice forlorn thy woman's hair my sister all unshorn floats back dishevelled strength in agony disproving thy man's name and while before the world thou burnest in a poet fire we see thy woman heart beat evermore through the large flame beat purer heart and higher till god unsex thee on thy heavenly shore where unincarnate spirits purely aspire elizabeth barrett browning end of poem this recording is in the public domain to victor hugo by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To Victor Hugo Victor in poesy, Victor in romance, Cloud-weaver of phantasmal hopes and fears, 
french of the french and lord of human tears child lover bard whose famed laurels glance darkening the wreath of all that would advance beyond our strait their claim to be thy peers we a titan by thy wintry weight of years as yet unbroken stormy voice of france who does not love our england so they say i know not england france all men to be will make one people ere man's race be run and i desiring that diviner day yield thee full thanks for thy full courtesy to younger england in the boy my son End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On a Bust of Dante by Thomas William Parsons From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia On a Bust of Dante See, from this counterfeit of him, whom Arno shall remember long how stern of liniment how grim the father was of tuscan song there but the burning sense of wrong perpetual care and scorn abide small friendship for the lordly throng distrust of all the world beside faithful if this one image be no dream his life was but a fight could any beatrice see a lover in that anchorite to that cold ghibelline's gloomy sight who could have guessed the visions came of beauty veiled with heavenly light in circles of eternal flame the lips as kumai's cavern close the cheeks with fast and sorrow thin the rigid front almost morose but for the patient hope within declare a life whose course hath been unsullied still though still severe which through the wavering days of sin kept itself icy chaste and clear not wholly such his haggard look when wandering once forlorn he strayed with no companion save his book to corvo's hushed monastic shade where as the benedictine laid his palm upon the pilgrim guest the single boon for which he prayed the convent's charity was rest peace dwells not here this rugged face betrays no spirit of repose the sullen warrior soul we trace the marble man of many woes such was his mien when first arose the thought of that strange tale divine when hell he peopled with his foes the scourge of many a guilty line war to the last he waged with all the tyrant canker worms of earth baron and duke in hold and hall cursed the dark hour that gave him birth he used rome's harlot for his mirth plucked bare hypocrisy and crime but valiant souls of knightly worth transmitted to the rolls of time o time whose verdicts mock our own the only righteous judge art thou that poor old exile sad and lone is latium's other virgil now before his name the nations bow his words are parcel of mankind deep in whose hearts as on his brow the marks have sunk of dante's mind end of poem this recording is in the public domain hans christian anderson eighteen o five to eighteen seventy five by edmund goss from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens hans christian anderson eighteen o five to eighteen seventy five a being cleaves the moonlit air with eyes of dew and plumes of fire new-born immortal strong and fair glance ere he goes his feet are shrouded like the dead but in his face a wild desire breaks like the dawn that flushes red and like a rose the stars shine out above his path and music wakes through all the skies what mortal such a triumph hath by death set free 
what earthly hands and heart are pure as this man's whose unshrinking eyes gaze onward through the deep obscure nor quail to see ah this was he who drank the fount of wisdom set in speechless things who patient watched the day-star mount while others slept ah this was he whose loving soul found heartbeats under trembling wings and heard divinest music roll where wild springs leapt for poor dumb lips had song for him and children's dreamings ran in tune and strange old heroes weird and dim walked by his side the very shadows loved him well and danced and flickered in the moon and left him wondrous tales to tell men far and wide and now no more he smiling walks through greenwood alleys full of sun and as he wanders turns and talks though none be there the children watch in vain the place where they were wont when day was done to see their poet's sweet worn face and faded hair yet dream not such a spirit dies though all its earthly shrine decay transfigured under clearer skies he sings anew the frail soul covering racked with pain and scored with vigil fades away the soul set free and young again glides upward through weep not but watch the moonlit air perchance a glory like a star may leave what hangs about him there and flash on us behold the void is full of light the beams pierce heaven from bar to bar and all the hollows of the night grow luminous end of poem this recording is in the public domain sir philip sidney from an elegy on a friend's passion for his astrophil by matthew royden from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Sir Philip Sidney Within these woods of Aradir he chief delight and pleasure took, and on the mountain Parthenir, upon the crystal liquid brook, the muses met him every day that taught him sing to write and say. When he descended down the mount, his personage seemed most divine, a thousand graces one might count upon his lovely cheerful eyne to hear him speak and sweetly smile you were in paradise the while a sweet attractive kind of grace a full assurance given by looks continual comfort in a face the lineament of gospel books i trow that countenance cannot lie whose thoughts are legible in the eye was never i did see that face was never care did hear that tongue was never mind did mind his grace that ever thought the travel long but eyes and ears and every thought were with his sweet perfection caught end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the memory of ben jonson by john cleveland from the world's best poetry volume seven Descriptive and Narrative Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. To the memory of Ben Jonson, the muse's fairest light in no dark time, the wonder of a learned age, the line which none can pass, the most proportioned wit, to nature the best judge of what was fit, the deepest, plainest, highest, clearest pen the voice most echoed by consenting men the soul which answered best to all well said by others and which most requital made tuned to the highest key of ancient rome returning all her music with his own in whom with nature study claimed a part and yet who to himself owed all his art here lies ben jonson every age will look with sorrow here with wonder on his book 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to Ben Jonson by Robert Herrick From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ode to Ben Jonson Ah, Ben, say how, oh when, shall we, thy guests, meet at those lyric feasts, made at the sun, the dog, the triple tun, where we such clusters had, as made us nobly wild, not mad, and yet each verse of thine outdid the meat, outdid the frolic wine. My Ben, or come again, or send to us thy wit's great overplus, but teach us yet wisely to husband it, lest we that talent spend, and having once brought to an end that precious stock, the store of such a wit, the world should have no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Portrait of Shakespeare by Ben Jonson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. On the Portrait of Shakespeare. This figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. But since he cannot, reader, look not at his picture, but his book. Ben Jonson End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. To the memory of my beloved master, William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us, by Ben Jonson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. To the memory of my beloved master, William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book and fame while I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much. Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage, my Shakespeare, rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer, or bid Beaumont lie a little further off to make thee room. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give that i not mix thee so my brain excuses i mean with great but disproportioned muses for if i thought my judgment were of years i should commit thee surely with thy peers and tell how far thou didst thou lily outshine or sporting kid or marlow's mighty line and though thou had small latin and less greek from thence to honour thee i will not seek for names but call forth thundering Iskylus, euripides and sophocles to us pecuvius Achaeus, him of cordova dead to live again to hear thy buskin tread and shake a stage or when thy socks were on leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent greece or haughty rome sent forth or since did from their ashes come triumph my britain thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of europe homage owe he was not of an age but for all time and all the muses still were in their prime when like apollo he came forth to warm our ears or like a mercury to charm nature herself was proud of his designs and joy to wear the dressing of his lines which were so richly spun and woven so fit as since she will vouchsafe no other wit the merry greek tart aristophanes 
need terence witty plotters now not please but antiquated and deserted lie as they were not of nature's family yet must i not give nature all thy art my gentle shakespeare must enjoy a part for though the poet's matter nature be his art doth give the fashion and that he who casts to write a living line must sweat such as thine are and strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame or for the laurel gain a scorn for a good poet's made as well as born and such wert thou look how the father's face lives in his issue even so the race of shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines in his well-turned and true filed lines in each of which he seems to shake a lance as brandished at the eyes of ignorance sweet swan of avon what a sight it were to see thee in our water yet appear and make those flights upon the banks of thames that so did take eliza and our james but stay i see thee in the hemisphere advanced and made a constellation there shine forth thou star of poets and with rage or influence chide or cheer the drooping stage which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night and despair's day but for thy volume's light End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shakespeare from Prologue by Dr. Samuel Johnson from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Shakespeare from Prologue spoken by mr garrick at the opening of the theatre in drury lane in 1747 when learning's triumph o'er her barbarous foes first reared the stage immortal shakespeare rose each change of many-coloured life he drew exhausted worlds and then imagined new existence saw him spurn her bounded reign and panting time toiled after him in vain his powerful strokes presiding truth impressed, And unresisted passion stormed the breast. Dr. Samuel Johnson End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Epitaph on the Admirable Dramatic Poet W. Shakespeare by John Milton from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by craig franklin an epitaph on the admirable dramatic poet w shakespeare what needs my shakespeare for his honoured bones the labour of an age in piled stones or that his hallowed relics should be hid under a starry pointed pyramid dear son of memory great heir of fame what needest thou such weak witness of thy name thou in our wonder and astonishment hast built thyself a living monument for whilst to the shame of slow endeavouring art thy easy numbers flow and that each heart hath from the leaves of thy unvalued book those delphic lines with deep impression took then thou our fancy of itself bereaving dost make us marvel with too much conceiving and so sepulchred in such pomp dost lie that kings for such a tomb would wish to die end of poem this recording is in the public domain Shakespeare by Hartley Coleridge from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Shakespeare The soul of man is larger than the sky, deeper than ocean, or the abysmal dark of the unfathomed centre. 
like that ark which in its sacred hold uplifted high o'er the drowned hills the human family and stock reserved of every living kind so in the compass of the single mind the seeds and pregnant forms in essence lie that make all words great poet twas thy art to know thyself and in thyself to be whate'er love hate ambition destiny or the firm fatal purpose of the heart can make of man yet thou wert still the same serene of thought unhurt by thy own flame hartley coleridge end of poem this recording is in the public domain guilielmus rex by thomas bailey aldrich from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by sonia guilielmus rex the folk who lived in shakespeare's day and saw that gentle figure pass by london bridge his frequent way they little knew what man he was the pointed beard the courteous mien the equal port to high and low all this they saw or might have seen but not the light behind the brow the doublet's modest gray or brown the slender sword hilt's plain device what sign had these for prince or clown few turned or none to scan him twice yet was the king of england's kings the rest with all their pomps and trains are moulded half remembered things tis he alone that lives and reigns end of poem this recording is in the public domain hierarchy of angels by thomas haywood from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin hierarchy of angels mellifluous shakespeare whose enchanting quill commanded mirth or passion was but will and famous johnson though his learned pen be dipped in castali is still but ben fletcher and webster of that learned pack none of the meanest was but jack decker but tom nor may nor middleton and he's but now jack ford that once was john end of poem this recording is in the public domain under the portrait of john milton prefix to paradise lost by john dryden from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by sonia under the portrait of john milton prefixed to paradise lost three poets in three distant ages born greece italy and england did adorn the first in loftiness of thought surpassed the next in majesty in both the last the force of nature could no further go to make a third she joined the former two end of poem this recording is in the public domain to milton london 1802 by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume 7 descriptive and narrative part 1 read for librivox.org by thomas peter to milton london 1802 milton thou shouldst be living at this hour england hath need of thee she is a fen of stagnant waters altar sword and pen fireside the heroic wealth of hall and bower have forfeited their ancient english dower of inward happiness we are selfish men oh raise us up return to us again and give us manners virtue freedom power 
thy soul was like a star and dwelt apart thou hadst a voice whose sound was like the sea pure as the naked heavens majestic free so didst thou travel on life's common way in cheerful godliness and yet thy heart the lowliest duties on herself did lay end of poem this recording is in the public domain Walton's Book of Lives, from Ecclesiastical Sonnets, Part 3, by William Wordsworth. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Walton's Book of Lives, from Ecclesiastical Sonnets, Part 3. There are no colors in the fairest sky so fair as these. The feather whence the pen was shaped that traced the lives of these good men dropped from an angel's wing. With moistened eye we read of faith and purest charity in statesman, priest, and humble citizen. Oh, could we copy their mild virtues, then what joy to live, what blessedness to die! Methinks their very names shine still and bright, apart, like glow-worms on a summer night or lonely tapers when from far they fling a guiding ray, or seen, like stars on high, satellites burning in a lucid ring around meek Walton's heavenly memory. William Wordsworth End of poem This recording is in the public domain. The Sonnet by William Wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by sonia the sonnet scorn not the sonnet critic you have frowned mindless of its just honours with this key shakespeare unlocked his heart the melody of this small lute gave ease to petrarch's wound a thousand times this pipe did tasso sound with it Camoig soothed an exile's grief. The sonnet glittered a gay myrtle leaf amid the cypress with which Dante crowned his visionary brow. A glow-worm lamp, it cheered mild Spencer, called from fairyland to struggle through dark ways, and when a damp fell round the path of Milton, in his hand the thing became a trumpet, whence he blew soul-animating strains alas too few end of poem this recording is in the public domain camp bell charade by winthrop mackworth praed from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by jason in canada Camp Bell, Charade Come from my first, I come, the battle dawn is nigh, And the screaming trump and the thundering drum Are calling thee to die. Fight as thy father fought, fall as thy father fell, Thy task is taught, thy shroud is wrought, So forward and farewell. Toll ye my second toll, Fling high the flambeau's light, And sing the hymn for a parted soul Beneath the silent night. The wreath upon his head, The cross upon his breast, Let the prayer be said and the tear be shed, So take him to his rest. Call ye my whole, I call the Lord of lute and lay, and let him greet the sable pall with a noble song to-day. Go, call him by his name. No fitter hand may crave to light the flame of a soldier's fame on the turf of a soldier's grave. Winthrop Mackworth Prayed End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Thomas More 
by lord byron from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin to thomas moore my boat is on the shore and my bark is on the sea but before i go tom moore here's a double health to thee here's a sigh to those who love me and a smile to those who hate and whatever skies above me here's a heart for every fate though the ocean roar around me yet it still shall bear me on though a desert should surround me it hath springs that may be won wert the last drop in the well as i gasped upon the brink ere my fainting spirit fell tis to thee that i would drink with that water as this wine the libation i would pour should be peace with thine and mine and health to thee tom moore end of poem this recording is in the public domain Shelley by Alexander Hay Jap From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Shelley The odour of a rose Light of a star The essence of a flame blown on by wind That lights and warms all near it Bland and kind But I consumes itself as though at war with what supports and feeds it from afar it draws its life but ever more inclined to leap into the flame that makes men blind who seek the secret of all things that are such wert thou shelley bound for airiest goal interpreter of quintessential things who mounted ever up on eagle wings of fantasy had aimed at heaven and stole promethean fire for men to be as gods and dwell in free aerial abodes end of poem this recording is in the public domain memorabilia by robert browning from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Memorabilia. Ah, did you once see Shelley plain? And did he stop and speak to you? And did you speak to him again? How strange it seems and new. But you were living before that, and also you are living after, and the memory I started at, my starting moves your laughter. I cross the moor with a name of its own and a certain use in the world no doubt yet a hand's breadth of it shines alone mid the blank miles round about for there i picked up on the heather and there i put inside my breast a moulted feather an eagle feather well i forget the rest end of poem this recording is in the public domain Byron from the course of time book four by robert pollock from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin byron from the course of time book four he touched his harp and nations heard entranced as some vast river of unfailing source rapid exhaustless deep his numbers flowed and opened new fountains in the human heart where fancy halted weary in her flight in other men his fresh as morning rose and soared untrodden heights and seemed at home where angels bashful looked others though great beneath their argument seemed struggling wiles he from above descending stooped to touch the loftiest thought and proudly stooped as though it scarce deserved his verse with nature's self he seemed an old acquaintance free to jest 
at will with all her glorious majesty he laid his hand upon the ocean's mane and played familiar with his hoary locks stood on the alps stood on the apennines and with the thunder talked as friend to friend and wove his garland of the lightning's wing in sportive twist the lightning's fiery wing which as the footsteps of the dreadful god marching upon the storm in vengeance seemed then turned and with the grasshopper who sung his evening song beneath his feet conversed suns moons and stars and clouds his sisters were rocks mountains meteors seas and winds and storms his brothers younger brothers whom he scarce as equals deemed all passions of all men the wild and tame the gentle and severe all thoughts all maxims sacred and profane all creeds all seasons time eternity all that was hated and all that was dear all that was hoped all that was feared by man he tossed about as tempest withered leaves then smiling looked upon the wreck he made with terror now he froze the cowering blood and now dissolved the heart in tenderness yet would not tremble would not weep himself but back into his soul retired alone dark sullen proud gazing contemptuously on hearts and passions prostrate at his feet end of poem this recording is in the public domain macaulay as poet by walter savage landor from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens macaulay as poet the dreamy rhymer's measured snore falls heavy on our ears no more and by long strides are left behind the dear delights of womankind who wage their battles like their loves in satin waistcoats and kid gloves and have achieved the crowning work when they have trussed and skewered a turk another comes with stouter tread and stalks among the statelier dead he rushes on and hails by turns high-crested scott broad-breasted burns and shows the british youth who ne'er will lag behind what romans were when all the tuscans and their lars shouted and shook the towers of mars end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the departure of sir walter scott from abbotsford for naples by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter on the departure of sir walter scott from abbotsford for naples a trouble not of clouds or weeping rain nor of the setting sun's pathetic light engendered hangs o'er eldon's triple height spirits of power assembled there complain for kindred power departing from their sight while tweed best pleased in chanting a blithe strain saddens his voice again and yet again lift up your hearts ye mourners for the might of the whole world's good wishes with him goes blessings and prayers a nobler retinue than sceptred king or laurelled conqueror knows follow this wondrous potentate be true ye winds of ocean and the midland sea wafting your charge to soft parthenope end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the memory of thomas hood by bartholomew simmons from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin to the memory of thomas hood take back into thy bosom earth this joyous may-eyed morrow 
the gentlest child that ever mirth gave to be reared by sorrow tis hard while rays half green half gold through vernal bowers are burning and streams like diamond mirrors hold to summer's face returning to say we're thankful that his sleep shall never more be lighter in whose sweet-tongued companionship stream a bower and beam grow brighter but all the more intensely true his soul gave out each feature of elemental love each hue and grace of golden nature the deeper still beneath it all lurked the keen jags of anguish the more the laurels clasped his brow their poison made it languish seemed it that like the nightingale of his own mournful singing the tender would his song prevail while most the thorn was stinging so never to the desert worn did fount bring freshness deeper than this his placid rest this morn has brought the shrouded sleeper that rest may lap his weary head where charles choke the city of where mid woodlands by his bed the wren shall wake its ditty but near or far while evening star is dear to hearts regretting around that spot admiring thought shall hover unforgetting end of poem this recording is in the public domain burns a poet's epitaph by ebenezer elliot from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter burns a poet's epitaph stop mortal here thy brother lies the poet of the poor his books were rivers woods and skies the meadow and the moor his teachers were the torn heart's wail the tyrant and the slave the street the factory the jail the palace and the grave sin met thy brother everywhere and is thy brother blamed from passion danger doubt and care he no exemption claimed the meanest thing earth's feeblest worm he feared to scorn or hate but honouring in a peasant's form the equal of the great he blessed the steward whose wealth makes the poor man's little more yet loathed the haughty wretch that takes from plundered labour's store a hand to do a head to plan a heart to feel and dare tell man's worst foes here lies the man who drew them as they are End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Burns on receiving a sprig of heather in blossom by John Greenleaf Whittier, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Seven, Descriptive and Narrative, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Burns on receiving a sprig of heather in blossom no more these simple flowers belong to scottish maid and lover sown in the common soil of song they bloom the wide world over in smiles and tears in sun and showers the minstrel and the heather the deathless singer and the flowers he sang of live together wild heather bells and robert burns the moorland flower and peasant how at their mansion memory turns her page is old and pleasant the grey sky wears again its gold and purple of adorning and manhood's noonday shadows hold the dews of boyhood's morning the dews that wash the dust and soil from off the wings of pleasure the sky that flecked the ground of toil with golden threads of leisure i call to mind the summer day the early harvest mowing the sky with sun and clouds at play and flowers with breezes blowing i hear the blackbird in the corn the locust in the haying and like the fabled hunter's horn old tunes my heart is playing 
how oft that day with fond delay i sought the maple's shadow and sang with burns the hours away forgetful of the meadow bees hummed birds twittered overhead i heard the squirrel sleeping the good dog listened while i read and wagged his tail in keeping i watched him while in sportive mood i read the twa dog's story and half believed he understood the poet's allegory sweet day sweet songs the golden hours grew brighter for that singing from brook and bird and meadow flowers a dearer welcome bringing new light on home seen nature beamed new glory over woman and daily life and duty seemed no longer poor and common i woke to find the simple truth of fact and feeling better than all the dreams that held my youth a still repining debtor that nature gives her handmaid art the themes of sweet discoursing the tender idols of the heart in every tongue rehearsing why dreams of lands of gold and pearl of loving knight and lady when farmer boy and barefoot girl were wandering there already i saw through all familiar things the romance underlying the joys and griefs that plume the wings of fancy skyward flying i saw the same blithe day return the same sweet fall of even that rose on wooded craggy burn and sank on crystal devon i matched with scotland's heathery hills the sweet briar and the clover with air and dune my native rills their wood hymns chanting over over rank and pomp as he had seen i saw the man uprising no longer common or unclean the child of god's baptizing with clearer eyes i saw the worth of life among the lowly the bible at his cotter's half had made my own more holy and if at times an evil strain to lawless love appealing broke in upon the sweet refrain of pure and healthful feeling it died upon the eye and ear no inward answer gaining no heart had i to see or hear the discord and the staining let those who never erred forget his worth in vain bewailings sweet soul of song i own my debt uncancelled by his failings lament who will the ribald line which tells his lapse from duty how kiss the maddening lips of wine or wanton ones of beauty but think while falls that shade between the erring one and heaven that he who loved the maudlin like her may be forgiven not his the song whose thunderous chime eternal echoes render the mournful tuscan's haunted rhyme and milton's starry splendor but who his human heart has laid to nature's bosom nearer who sweetened toil like him or paid to love a tribute dearer through all his tuneful art how strong the human feeling gushes the very moonlight of his song is warm with smiles and blushes give lettered pomp to teeth of time so bonny dune but tarry blot out the epic's stately rhyme but spare his highland merry end of poem this recording is in the public domain to benjamin robert hayden by john keats from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by sonia to benjamin robert hayden great spirits now on earth are sojourning he of the cloud the cataract the lake who on hell valiant summit wide awake catches his freshness from archangel's wing he of the rose the violet the spring the social smile the chain for freedom's sake and lo whose steadfastness would never take a meaner sound than raffles whispering and other spirits there are standing apart upon the forehead of the age to come these these will give the world another heart and other pulses 
hear ye not the hum of mighty workings listen awhile ye nations and be dumb end of poem this recording is in the public domain on a portrait of wordsworth by b r hayden by elizabeth barrett browning from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens on a portrait of wordsworth by b r hayden wordsworth upon helvellyn let the cloud ebb audibly along the mountain wind then break against the rock and show behind the lowland valleys floating up to crowd the sense with beauty he with forehead bowed and humble lidded eyes as one inclined before the sovereign thought of his own mind and very meek with inspirations proud takes here his rightful place as poet priest by the high altar singing prayer and prayer to the higher heavens a noble vision free our hayden's hand hath flung out from the mist no portrait this with academic air this is the poet and his poetry end of poem this recording is in the public domain the lost leader by robert browning from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin the lost leader just for a handful of silver he left us just for a ribbon to stick in his coat found the one gift of which fortune bereft us lost all the others she lets us devote they with the gold to give doled him out silver so much was theirs who so little allowed how all our copper had gone for his service rags were they purple his heart had been proud we that had loved him so followed him honoured him lived in his mild and magnificent eye learned his great language caught his clear accents made him our pattern to live and to die shakespeare was of us milton was for us burns shelley were with us they watched from their graves he alone breaks from the van and the freeman he alone sinks to the rear and the slaves we shall march prospering not through his presence songs may inspirit us not from his leer deeds will be done while he boasts his quiescence still bidding crouch whom the rest bade aspire blot out his name then record one lost soul more one task more declined one more footpath untrod one more devil's triumph and sorrow for angels one wrong more to man one more insult to god life's night begins let him never come back to us there would be doubt hesitation and pain forced praise on our part the glimmer of twilight never glad confident morning again best fight on well for we taught him strike gallantly menace our heart ere we master his own then let him receive the new knowledge and wait us pardoned in heaven the first by the throne end of poem footnote this bitter attack famous for its invective was made by browning eighteen forty five on wordsworth after the latter had accepted the post of poet laureate eighteen forty three thus in browning's view deserting the people and selling himself to the government wordsworth's only official poem however was on the installation of albert prince consort as chancellor of cambridge university in eighteen forty seven and in eighteen fifty he died so that the protest of browning was not justified indeed in eighteen seventy five browning himself wrote I did in my hasty youth presume to use the great and venerated personality of Wordsworth as a sort of painter's model, one from which this or the other particular feature may be selected and turned to account. Had I intended more? 
I should not have talked about handfuls of silver and bits of ribbon. These never influenced the change of politics in the great poet, whose defection, nevertheless, was to my juvenile apprehension and even mature consideration an event to be deplored. End of footnote. This recording is in the public domain. Memorial Verses, April 1850, by Matthew Arnold, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. Memorial Verses, April 1850 Goethe in Weimar sleeps, and Greece, long since, saw Byron's struggles cease. But one such death remained to come, the last poetic voice is dumb. We stand today by Wordsworth's tomb. When Byron's eyes were shut in death, we bowed our head and held our breath. He taught us little, but our soul had felt him like the thunder's roll. With shivering heart the strife we saw of passion with eternal law, and yet with reverential awe. We watched the fount of fiery life which served for that titanic strife. When Goethe's death was told, we said, Sunk then is Europe's sagest head. Physician of the Iron Age, Goethe has done his pilgrimage. He took the suffering human race. He read each wound, each weakness clear, and struck his finger on the place and said, Thou ailest here and here. He looked on Europe's dying hour, A fitful dream at feverish power. His eye plunged down the weltering strife, The turmoil of expiring life. He said, The end is everywhere. Art still has truth. Take refuge there. And he was happy, if to know causes of things, and far below his feet to see the lurid flow of terror and insane distress and headlong fate be happiness. And Wordsworth, ah, pale ghosts rejoice, for never has such soothing voice been to your shadowy world conveyed since erst at morn some wandering shade heard the clear song of Orpheus come through Hades and the mournful gloom. Wordsworth has gone from us, and ye, ah, may ye feel his voice as we. He too upon a wintry clime had fallen, on this iron time of doubts, disputes, distractions, fears. He found us when the age had bound our souls in its benumbing round. He spoke and loosed our hearts in tears. He laid us as we lay at birth on the cool flowery lap of earth. Smiles broke from us and we had ease. The hills were round us and the breeze went o'er the sunlit fields again. Our foreheads felt the wind and rain. Our youth returned, for there was shed on spirits that had long been dead, spirits dried up and closely furled, the freshness of the early world. Ah, since dark days still bright to light man's prudence and man's fiery might, Time may restore us in his course, get his sage mind and Byron's force. But where will Europe's latter hour again find Wordsworth's healing power? Others will teach us how to dare, and against fear our breast to steel. Others will strengthen us to bear. But who, ah, who will make us feel? The cloud of mortal destiny, others will front it fearlessly. But who, like him, will put it by? Keep fresh the grass upon his grave, O Rotha, with thy living wave. Sing him thy best, 
for few or none hears thy voice right now he is gone end of poem this recording is in the public domain from wordsworth's grave by william watson from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter from wordsworth's grave poet who sleepest by this wandering wave when thou wast born what birth gift hadst thou then to thee what wealth was that the immortals gave the wealth thou gavest in thy turn to men not milton's keen translunar music thine nor shakespeare's cloudless boundless human view not shelley's flush of rose on peaks divine nor yet the wizard twilight coleridge knew what hadst thou that could make so large amends for all thou hadst not and thy peers possessed motion and fire swift means to radiant ends thou hadst for weary feet the gift of rest from shelley's dazzling glow or thunderous haze from byron's tempest anger tempest mirth men turned to thee and found not blast and blaze tumult of tottering heavens but peace on earth nor peace that grows by leaf scentless flower there in white languors to decline and cease but peace whose names are also rapture power clear sight and love for these are parts of peace end of poem this recording is in the public domain In Memory of Walter Savage Landor by Algernon Charles Swinburne From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada In Memory of Walter Savage Landor Back to the flower town, side by side The bright months bring, newborn, The bridegroom and the bride freedom and spring the sweet land laughs from sea to sea filled full of sun all things come back to her being free all things but one in many a tender wheaten plot flowers that were dead live and old sons revive but not that holier head by this white wandering waste of sea far north I hear one face shall never turn to me as once this year, Shall never smile and turn and rest on mine as there, Nor one most sacred hand be pressed upon my hair. I come as one whose thoughts half linger, half run before, The youngest to the oldest singer that England bore. I found him whom I shall not find till all grief end, in holiest age, our mightiest mind, father and friend. But thou, if anything endure, if hope there be, O spirit that man's life left pure, man's death set free, not with disdain of days that were look earthward now. Let dreams revive the reverend hair, the imperial brow. Come back in sleep. For in the life where thou art not we find none like thee. Time and strife and the world's lot move thee no more. But love at last and reverent heart may move thee, Royal and released soul as thou art. And thou, his Florence, to thy trust receive and keep. Keep safe his dedicated dust, his sacred sleep. So shall thy lovers come from far, Mix with thy name as morning star With evening star his faultless fame. Algernon Charles Swinburne 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Welcome to Boz on his first visit to the West by W. H. Venable from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. A Welcome to Boz on his first visit to the West. Come as artist, come as guest, welcome to the expectant West, hero of the charmed pen, loved of children, loved of men, we have felt thy spell for years, oft with laughter, oft with tears, thou hast touched the tenderest part of our inmost hidden heart. We have fixed our eager gaze on thy pages, nights and days, wishing as we turned them o'er, like poor Oliver, for more, and the creatures of thy brain in our memory remain, till through them we seem to be old acquaintances of thee. Much we hold it thee to greet, gladly sit we at thy feet. On thy features we would look, as upon a living book, and thy voice would grateful hear, glad to feel that Boz were near, that his veritable soul held us by direct control. Therefore, author loved the best, welcome, welcome to the West. In immortal Weller's name, by Micawber's deathless fame, by the flogging reeked on squeers, by Job Trotter's fluent tears, by the beadle Bumble's fate, at the hands of vixen mate, by the famous Pickwick Club, by the dream of Gabriel Grubb, in the name of Snodgrass's muse, Tupman's amorous interviews, Winkle's ludicrous mishaps, and the fat boy's countless naps, by Ben Allen and Bob Sawyer, by Miss Sally Brass, the lawyer, in the name of Newman Noggs, River Thames and London Fogs, Richard Swiveller's excess, feasting with the Marchioness, by Jack Bunsby's oracles, by the chime of Christmas bells, by the cricket on the hearth, Scrooge's frown and Crotchet's mirth, by spread tables and good cheer, wayside inns and pots of beer, Hostess, plump and jolly host, coaches for the turnpike post, chambermaids in love with boots, toodles, traddles, tapley, toots, yarley, varden, Mr. Dick, Susan Nipper, Mistress Chick, Snevelici, Lilivik, Mantellini's predilections, to transfer his dem afflictions, Potsnap, Pecksniff, Chuzzlewit, Quilp and Simon Tapperit, Wegg and Boffin, Smike and Paul, Nell and Jenny Wren, and all. Be not Sairy Gamp forgot, no, nor Peggotty and Trot, by poor Barnaby and Grip, Flora, Dora, Di and Gip, Perry Bingle, Pinch and Pip. Welcome, long-expected guest. Welcome, Dickens, to the West. In the name of gentle Nell, child of light, beloved well, weeping, did we not behold roses on her bosom cold? Better we for every tear shed beside her snowy bier by the mournful group that played round the grave where Smike was laid by the life of Tiny Tim and the lesson taught by him asking in his plaintive tone God to bless us every one by the sounding waves that bore little Paul to heaven's shore by thy yearning for the human good in every man and woman, by each noble deed and word that thy story-books record, and each noble sentiment Dickens to the world hath lent, by the effort thou hast made truth and true reform to aid, by thy hope of man's relief, finally from want and grief, by thy never-failing trust, that the God of love is just, we would meet and welcome thee, preacher of humanity. Welcome fills the throbbing breast of the sympathetic West. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dickens in Camp by Bret Hart From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 
Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Dickens in Camp Above the pines the moon was slowly drifting, The river sang below, The dim sierras far beyond uplifting Their minarets of snow. The roaring campfire with a rude humour Painted the ruddy tints of health On haggard face and form that drooped and fainted In the fierce race for wealth till one arose, and from his pack's scant treasure a hoarded volume drew, and cards were dropped from hands of listless leisure to hear the tale anew. And then, while round them shadows gathered faster, and as the firelight fell, he read aloud the book wherein the master had writ of Little Nell. Perhaps twas boyish fancy, for the reader was youngest of them all, but as he read from clustering pine and cedar a silence seemed to fall the fir trees gathering closer in the shadows listened in every spray while the whole camp with nell on english meadows wandered and lost their way and so in mountain solitudes o'ertaken as by some spell divine their cares dropped from them like the needles shaken from out the gusty pine. Lost is that camp, and wasted all its fire, and he who wrought that spell, ah, towering pine and stately Kentish spire, ye have one tale to tell. Lost is that camp, but let its fragrant story Blend with the breath that thrills, With hot vines incense all the pensive glory That fills the Kentish hills. And on that grave where English oak and holly And laurel wreaths entwine, Deem it not all a too presumptuous folly, The spray of western pine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dickens by Algernon Charles Swinburne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens Dickens Chief in thy generation, born of men, Whom English praise acclaimed as English-born, With eyes that matched the world-wide eyes of morn, For gleam of tears or laughter, tenderest then when thoughts of children warmed their light or when reverence of age with love and labour worn or godlike pity fired with godlike scorn shot through them flame that winged thy swift live pen where stars and suns that we beheld not burn higher even than here though highest was here thy place love sees thy spirit laugh and speak and shine with shakespeare and the soft bright soul of stern and fielding's kindliest might and goldsmith's grace scarce one more loved or worthier than thine end of poem this recording is in the public domain to thackeray by richard monkton milnes lord houghton from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. To Thackeray O gentler censor of our age, prime master of our ampler tongue, whose word of wit and generous page were never wroth except with wrong, fielding without the manner's dross, Scott with the spirit's larger room, what prelate deems thy grave his loss? What Halifax erects thy tomb? But may be he, who could so draw the hidden great, the humble wise, yielding with them to God's good law, makes the pantheon where he lies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tennyson by Thomas Bailey Aldrich 
from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox .org by sonia tennyson shakespeare and milton what third blazoned name shall lips of after ages link to these his who beside the wild and circling seas was england's voice her voice with one acclaim for threescore years whose word of praise was fame whose scorn gave pause to man's iniquities what strain was his in that crimean war a bugle call in battle a low breath plaintive and sweet above the fields of death so year by year the music rolled afar from euxine wastes to flowery kandahar bearing the laurel or the cypress wreath others shall have their little space of time their proper niche and bust then fade away into the darkness poets of a day but thou o builder of enduring rhyme thou shalt not pass thy fame in every clime on earth shall live where saxon speech has sway waft me this verse across the winter sea through light and dark through mist and blinding sleet o wintry winds and lay it at his feet though the poor gift betray my poverty at his feet lay it it may chance that he will find no gift where reverence is unmeet end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lacrimae Musarum, 6th of October, 1892, by William Watson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. Lacrimae Musarum, 6th of October, 1892. Lo, like another's lies the laurelled head, the life that seemed a perfect song is o'er carry the last great bard to his last bed land that he loved thy noblest voice is mute land that he loved that loved him never more meadow of thine smooth lawn or wild seashore gardens of odorous bloom and tremulous fruit or woodlands old like druid couches spread the master's feet shall tread death's little rift hath rent the faultless lute the singer of undying songs is dead lo in this season pensive hued and grave while fades and falls the doomed reluctant leaf from withered earth's fantastic coronal with wandering sighs of forest and of wave mingles the murmur of a people's grief for him whose leaf shall fade not either fall he hath fared forth beyond these suns and showers for us the autumn glow the autumn flame and soon the winter silent shall be ours him the eternal spring of fadeless fame crowns with no mortal flowers rapt though he be from us virgil salutes him and theocritus catullus mightiest brained lucretius each greets him their brother on the stygian beach proudly a gaunt right hand doth dante reach milton and wordsworth bid him welcome home bright keats to touch his raiment doth beseech coleridge his locks aspersed with fairy foam calm spencer chaucer suave his equal friendship crave and godlike spirits hail him guest in speech of athens florence weimar stratford rome what needs his laurel our ephemeral tears to save from visitation of decay not in his temporal sunlight now that bay blooms nor to perishable mundane ears sings he with lips of transitory clay for he hath joined the chorus of his peers in habitations of the perfect day his earthly notes a heavenly audience hears and more melodious are henceforth the spheres enriched with music stolen from earth away he hath returned to regions whence he came 
him doth the spirit divine of universal loveliness reclaim all nature is his shrine seek him henceforth in the wind and sea in earth's and air's emotion or repose in every star's august serenity and in the rapture of the flaming rose there seek him if you would not seek in vain there in the rhythm and music of the whole yea and for ever in the human soul made stronger and more beauteous by his strain for lo creation's self is one great choir and what is nature's order but the rhyme whereto the worlds keep time and all things move with all things from their prime who shall expound the mystery of the lyre in far retreats of elemental mind obscurely comes and goes the imperative breath of song that as the wind is trackless and oblivious whence it blows demand of lilies wherefore they are white extort her crimson secret from the rose but ask not of the muse that she disclose the meaning of the riddle of her might somewhat of all things sealed and recondite save the enigma of herself she knows the master could not tell with all his lore wherefore he sang or whence the mandate sped even as the linnet sings so i he said ah rather as the imperial nightingale that held in trance the ancient attic shore and charms the ages with the notes that o'er all woodland chants immortally prevail and now from our vain plaudits greatly fled he with diviner silence dwells instead and on no earthly sea with transient roar unto no earthly airs he trims his sail but far beyond our vision and our hail is heard for ever and is seen no more no more o oh, never now lord of the lofty and the tranquil brow whereon nor snows of time have fallen nor wintry rhyme shall men behold thee sage and mage sublime once in his youth obscure the maker of this verse which shall endure by splendour of its theme that cannot die beheld thee eye to eye and touched through thee the hand of every hero of thy race divine even to the sire of all the laurelled line the sightless wanderer on the ionian strand with soul as healthful as the poignant brine wide as his skies and radiant as his seas starry from haunts of his familiars nine glorious myonides yet i beheld thee and behold thee yet thou hast forgotten but can i forget the accents of thy pure and sovereign tongue are they not ever goldenly impressed on memory's palimpsest i see the wizard locks like night that hung i tread the floor thy hallowing feet have trod i see the hands a nation's lyre that strung the eyes that looked through life and gazed on god the seasons change the winds they shift and veer the grass of yesteryear is dead the birds depart the groves decay empires dissolve and peoples disappear song passes not away captains and conquerors leave a little dust and kings a dubious legend of their reign the swords of caesars they are less than rust the poet doth remain dead is augustus marrow is live and thou the mantuan of our age and clime like virgil shalt thy race and tongue survive bequeathing no less honeyed words to time embalmed in amber of eternal rhyme and rich with sweets from every muse's hive while to the measure of the cosmic rune for purer ears thou shalt thy lyre attune and heed no more the hum of idle praise in that great calm our tumults cannot reach master who crownst our immelodious days with flower of perfect speech End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Robert Browning by Walter Savage Landor From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Robert Browning There is delight in singing, though none here beside the singer. And there is delight in praising, though the praiser sit alone and see the praised far off him far above shakespeare is not our poet but the world's therefore on him no speech and brief for thee browning since chaucer was alive and hale no man hath walked along our roads with step so active so inquiring eye or tongue so varied in discourse but warmer climes give brighter plumage stronger wing the breeze of alpine's heights thou playest with borne on beyond sorrento and amalfi where the siren waits thee singing song for song walter savage landor end of poem this recording is in the public domain the burial of robert browning by michael field from the world's best poetry Volume 7. Descriptive and Narrative. Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. The Burial of Robert Browning Upon St. Michael's Isle they laid him for a while, that he might feel the ocean's full embrace, and wedded be to that wide sea, the subject and the passion of his race. As Thetis, from some lovely underground, Springing she girds him round, With lapping sound and silent space, Then, on more honour bent, She sues the firmament, And bids the hovering western clouds combine, To spread their sabled amber on her lustrous brine. It might not be, he should lie free, Forever in the soft light of the sea, For lo, one came, of step more slow than fame, Stooped over him, we heard her breathe his name, And as the light drew back, Bore him across the track Of the subservient waves that dare not foil That veiled maternal figure of its spoil. Ah, where will she put by her journeying majesty? She hath left the lands of the air and sun, She will take no rest, till her course be run, follow her far, follow her fast, until, at last, within a narrow transept led, lo, she unwraps her face to pall her dead. Tis England who has travelled far, England who brings fresh splendour to her galaxy of kings. We kiss her feet, her hands, where eloquent she stands, nor dare to lend a wailful choir about the poet dumb, who is become part of the glory that her sons would bleed to save from scar, yea, hers in very deed as Runnymede or Trafalgar. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Joseph Rodman Drake died in new york september eighteen twenty by fitz green halleck from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by jason in canada joseph rodman drake died in new york september eighteen twenty green be the turf above thee friend of my better days none knew thee but to love thee nor named thee but to praise. Tears fell when thou wert dying from eyes unused to weep, and long where thou art lying will tears the cold turf steep. When hearts whose truth was proven, like thine are laid in earth, there should a wreath be woven to tell the world their worth. And I who woke each morrow to clasp thy hand in mine, who shared thy joy and sorrow, whose weal and woe were thine. 
it should be mine to braid it around thy faded brow but i've in vain essayed it and feel i cannot now while memory bids me weep thee nor thoughts nor words are free the grief is fixed too deeply that mourns a man like thee fitz green hallock end of poem this recording is in the public domain fitz green hallock by john greenleaf whittier from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter fitz green hallock read at the unveiling of his statue in central park may eighteen seventy seven among their graven shapes to whom thy civic wreaths belong o city of his love make room for one whose gift was song not his the soldier's sword to wield nor his the helm of state nor glory of the stricken field nor triumph of debate in common ways with common men he served his race and time as well as if his clerkly pen had never danced to rhyme if in the thronged and noisy mart the muses found their son could any say his tuneful art a duty left undone he toiled and sang and year by year men found their homes more sweet and through a tenderer atmosphere looked down the brick-walled street the greeks wild onset wall street knew the red king walked broadway and all my castles roses blew from palisades to bay fair city by the sea upraise his veil with reverent hands and mingle with thy own the praise and pride of other lands let greece his fiery lyric breathe above her hero urns and scotland with her holly wreathe the flowers he called for burns o oh, stately stand thy palace walls thy tall ships ride the seas to-day thy poet's name recalls a prouder thought than these not less thy pulse of trade shall beat nor less thy tall fleet swim that shaded square and dusty street are classic ground through him alive he loved like all who sing the echoes of his song too late the tardy mead we bring the praise delayed so long too late alas of all who knew the living man to-day before his unveiled face how few make bare their locks of grey our lips of praise must soon be dumb our grateful eyes be dim o oh, brothers of the days to come take tender charge of him new hands the wires of song may sweep new voices challenge fame but let no moss of year o'er creep the lines of halleck's name end of poem this recording is in the public domain poe's cottage at fordham by john henry boner from the world's best poetry volume seven Descriptive and Narrative Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Poe's Cottage at Fordham Here lived the soul enchanted by melody of song. Here dwelt the spirit haunted by a demoniac throng. Here sang the lips elated, here grief and death were sated, here loved and here unmated was he so frail so strong here wintry winds and cheerless the dying firelight blew while he whose song was peerless dreamt the drear midnight through and from dull embers chilling crept shadows darkly filling the silent place and thrilling his fancy as they grew here with brow bared to heaven in starry night he stood with a lost star of seven feeling sad brotherhood here in the sobbing showers of dark autumnal hours he heard suspected powers shriek through the stormy wood 
from visions of apollo and of astarte's bliss he gazed into the hollow and hopeless veil of dis and though heaven was surrounded by heaven it still was mounded with graves his soul had sounded the dolorous abyss proud mad but not defiant he touched at heaven and hell fate found a rare soul pliant and rung her changes well alternately his lyre stranded with strings of fire led earth's most happy choir or flashed with israfel no singer of old story looting accustomed lays no harper for new glory no mendicant for praise he struck his chords and splendid wherein were fiercely blended tones that unfinished ended with his unfinished days here through this lowly portal made sacred by his name unheralded immortal the mortal went and came and fate that then denied him and envy that decried him and malice that belied him have cenotaphed his fame end of poem this recording is in the public domain On the Death of Thomas Carlyle and George Eliot by Algernon Charles Swinburne. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. On the Death of Thomas Carlyle and George Eliot. Two souls diverse out of our human sight pass, followed one with love and each with wonder. The stormy sophist with his mouth of thunder clothed with loud words and mantled in the might of darkness and magnificence of night and one whose eye could smite the night in sunder searching if light or no light were thereunder and found in love of loving kindness light duty divine and thought with eyes of fire still following righteousness with deep desire shone soul and stern before her and above sure stars and soul to steer by but more sweet shone lower the loveliest lamp for earthly feet the light of little children and their love end of poem this recording is in the public domain carlyle and emerson by montgomery Schuyler from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens carlyle and emerson a bale fire kindled in the night by night ablaze by day a cloud with flame and smoke all england woke it climbed so high it roared so loud while over massachusetts pines uprose a white and steadfast star and many a night it hung unwatched it shone so still it seemed so far but light is fire and fire is light and mariners are glad for these the torch that flares along the coast the star that beams above the seas end of poem this recording is in the public domain Emerson, Concord, by Sarah Chauncey Woolsey, Susan Coolidge, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Seven, Descriptive and Narrative, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Emerson, Concord. Farther horizons every year, O tossing pines which surge and wave above the poet's just made grave and waken for his sleeping ear the music that he loved to hear through summer's sun and winter's chill with purpose staunch and dauntless will sped by a noble discontent you climb toward the blue firmament climb as the winds climb mounting high the viewless ladders of the sky spurning our lower atmosphere heavy with sighs and dense with night and urging upward year by year to ampler air diviner light farther horizons every year 
Beneath you pass the tribes of men, Your gracious boughs o'ershadow them. You hear, but do not seem to heed Their jarring speech, their faulty creed. Your roots are firmly set in soil, One from their humming paths of toil. Content their lives to watch and share, To serve them, shelter, and upbear, Yet but to win an upward way And larger gift of heaven than they. Benignant view and attitude, Close knowledge of celestial sign, Still working for all earthly good, While pressing on to the divine. Farther horizons every year. So he by reverent heads just laid Beneath your layers of waving shade, Climbed as you climb the upward way, Knowing not boundary nor stay. His eyes surcharged with heavenly lights, His senses steeped in heavenly sights, His soul attuned to heavenly keys. How should he pause for rest or ease, Or turn his winged feet again To share the common feasts of men? He blessed them with his word and smile, But, still above their fickle moods, Wooing, constraining him, the while beckoned with shining altitudes. Farther horizons every year. To what immeasurable height, what clear irradiance of light, what far and all transcendent goal hast thou now risen, O steadfast soul? We may not follow with our eyes to where the further pathway lies, nor guess what vision, vast and free, God keeps in store for souls like thee. But still the sentry pines, which wave their boughs above thy honored grave, shall be thy emblems brave and fit, firm rooted in the stalwart sod, blessing the earth while spurning it, content with nothing short of God. Sarah Chauncey Woolsey, Susan Coolidge End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lowell on Himself From A Fable for Critics by James Russell Lowell From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Lowell on Himself From A Fable for Critics There is a Lowell whose striving Parnassus to climb With a whole bale of isms tied together with rhyme he might get on alone, spite of brambles and boulders, but he can't with that bundle he has on his shoulders. The top of the hill he will ne'er come nigh reaching, till he learns the distinction twixt singing and preaching. His lyre has some chords that would ring pretty well, but he'd rather by half make a drum of the shell, and rattle away till he's old as Methuselah at the head of a march to the last new jerusalem end of poem this recording is in the public domain out from behind this mask to confront his own portrait for the wound dresser in leaves of grass by walt whitman from the world's best poetry volume 7 descriptive and narrative Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. Out from behind this mask, to confront his own portrait for the wound dresser, in Leaves of Grass. Out from behind this bending, rough-cut mask, these lights and shades, this drama of the whole, this common curtain of the face contained in me, for me, in you, for you, in each this common curtain of the face contained in me for me in you for you in each for each tragedies sorrows laughter tears o oh heaven the passionate teeming plays this curtain hid this glaze of god's serenest purest sky this film of satan's seething pit this heart's geography's map this limitless small continent, this soundless sea, out from the convolutions of this globe, 
this subtler astronomic orb than sun or moon than jupiter venus mars this condensation of the universe nay here the only universe here the idea all in this mystic handful wrapped these burned eyes flashing to you to pass to future time to launch and spin through space revolving sidling from these to emanate to you whoe'er you are a look a traveller of thoughts and years of peace and war of youth long sped and middling age declining as the first volume of a tale perused and laid away and this the second songs ventures speculations presently to close lingering a moment here and now to you i opposite turn as on the road or at some crevice door by chance or opened window pausing inclining bearing my head you specially i greet to draw and clinch your soul for once inseparably with mine then travel travel on end of poem this recording is in the public domain myself from the song of myself by walt whitman from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin myself from the song of myself by walt whitman i celebrate myself and sing myself and what i assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you i loaf and invite my soul i lean and loaf at my ease observing a spear of summer grass my tongue every atom of my blood formed from this soil this air born here of parents born here from parents the same and their parents the same i now thirty-seven years old in perfect health begin hoping to cease not till death creeds and schools in abeyance retiring back a while sufficed at what they are but never forgotten i harbour for good or bad i permit to speak at every hazard nature without check with original energy end of poem this recording is in the public domain hawthorne by edmund clarence stedman from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for LibriVox.org by jason in canada hawthorne harp of new england song that even in slumber trembled with the touch of poets who like the four winds from thee waken all harmonies that to thy strings belong say wilt thou blame the younger hands too much which from thy laurelled resting place have taken thee crowned one in their hold there is a name should quicken thee no carol hawthorne sang yet his articulate spirit like thine own made answer quick as flame to each breath of the shore from which he sprang and prose like his was posy's high tone but he whose quickened eye saw through new england's life her inmost spirit her heart and all the stays on which it lent returns not since he laid the pencil by whose mystic touch none other shall inherit what though its work unfinished lies half bent the rainbow's arch fades out in upper air the shining cataract half way down the height breaks into mist the haunting strain that fell on listeners unaware ends incomplete but through the starry night the ear still waits for what it did not tell edmund clarence stedman end of poem this recording is in the public domain hawthorne by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one 
Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Hawthorne. How beautiful it was that one bright day in the long week of rain! Though all its splendor could not chase away the omnipresent pain. The lovely town was white with apple blooms, and the great elms o'erhead dark shadows wove on their aerial looms shot through with golden thread. Across the meadows, by the gray old manse, the historic river flowed. I was as one who wanders in a trance, unconscious of his road. The faces of familiar friends seemed strange, their voices I could hear, and yet the words they uttered seemed to change their meaning to my ear. For the one face I looked for was not there, the one low voice was mute, only an unseen presence filled the air and baffled my pursuit. Now I look back, and meadow, manse, and stream dimly my thought defines. I only see a dream within a dream, the hilltop hearsed with pines. I only hear above his place of rest their tender undertone, the infinite longings of a troubled breast, the voice so like his own. There in seclusion, and remote from men, the wizard hand lies cold, which at its topmost speed let fall the pen and left the tale half told. Ah, who shall lift that wand of magic power and the lost clue regain? The unfinished window in Aladdin's tower, unfinished, must remain. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Harriet Beecher Stowe by Paul Lawrence Dunbar From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens Harriet Beecher Stowe She told the story, and the whole world wept at wrongs and cruelties it had not known, but for this fearless woman's voice alone. She spoke to consciences that long had slept, her message, freedom's clear revale, swept from heedless hovel to complacent throne. Command and prophecy were in the tone, and from its sheath the sword of justice leapt. Around two peoples swelled a fiery wave, but both came forth, transfigured from the flame blessed be the hand that dared be strong to save and blessed be she who in our weakness came prophet and priestess at one stroke she gave a race to freedom and herself to fame end of poem this recording is in the public domain To Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, on his birthday, 27th February, 1867. By James Russell Lowell, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. To Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, on his birthday, 27th February, 1867. I need not praise the sweetness of his song, where limpid verse to limpid verse succeeds smooth as our Charles, when, fearing lest he wrong the new moon's mirrored skiff, he slides along, full without noise, and whispers in his reeds. With loving breath of all the winds his name is blown about the world, but to his friends a sweeter secret hides behind his fame and love steals shyly through the loud acclaim to murmur a god bless you and there ends as i muse backward up the checkered years wherein so much was given so much was lost blessings in both kinds such as cheapen tears but hush this is not for profaner ears let them drink molten pearls nor dream the cost some suck up poison from a sorrow's core as naught but nightshade grew upon earth's ground. Love turned all his to heart's ease, and the more fate tried his bastions, 
she but forced a door, leading to sweeter manhood and more sound. Even as a wind-waved fountain's swaying shade seems of mixed race, a gray wraith shot with sun, so through his trial faith translucent rayed, till darkness, half disnatured so, betrayed a heart of sunshine that would fain or run. Surely if skill in song these shears may stay, and of its purpose cheat the charmed abyss, if our poor life be lengthened by a lay, he shall not go, although his presence may, and the next age in praise shall double this. Long days be his, and each as lusty sweet as gracious natures find his song to be. May age steal on with softly cadenced feet, falling in music, as for him were meet whose choicest verse is harsher toned than he. James Russell Lowell End of poem This recording is in the public domain. Longfellow in Memoriam by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens Longfellow in Memoriam Nec turpem senectam digere nic cithara carentem not to be tuneless in old age, ah, surely blessed his pilgrimage, who, in his winter's snow, still sings with note as sweet and clear as in the mornings of the year when the first violets blow. Blessed, but more blessed, whom summer's heat, whom spring's impulsive stir and beat, have taught no feverish lure, whose muse, benignant and serene, still keeps his autumn chaplet green because his verse is pure lie calm o white and laureate head lie calm o dead that art not dead since from the voiceless grave thy voice shall speak to old and young while song yet speaks our english tongue by charles or famous wave End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. House by Robert Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens House Shall I sonnet sing you about myself? Do I live in a house you would like to see? Is it scant of gear? Has it store of pelf? Unlock my heart with a sonnet key. Invite the world as my betters have done. Take notice, this building remains on view. Its suites of reception, every one. Its private apartments and bedroom, too. For a ticket, apply to the publisher. No, thanking the public, I must decline. A peep through my window, folk prefer. But please you, no foot over threshold of mine. I have mixed with a crowd and heard free talk in a foreign land where an earthquake chanced and a house stood gaping naught to bulk man's eye wherever he gazed or glanced. The whole of the frontage, shaven sheer, the inside gaped, exposed to-day, right and wrong and common and queer, bare as the palm of your hand it lay. The owner? Oh! He had been crushed, no doubt. Odd tables and chairs for a man of wealth. What a parcel of musty old books about. He smoked. No wonder he lost his health. I doubt if he bathed before he dressed. A brazier, the pagan, he burned perfumes. You see, it is proved what the neighbours guessed. His wife and himself had separate rooms. Friends, the good man of the house at least kept house to himself till an earthquake came. "'Tis the fall of its frontage permits you to feast "'on the inside arrangement you praise or blame. "'Outside should suffice for evidence, "'and whoso desires to penetrate deeper "'must dive by the spirit sense, "'no optics like yours at any rate. "'Hoity-toity, a street to explore, "'your house the exception, 
with this same key shakespeare unlocked his heart once more did shakespeare if so the less shakespeare he end of poem this recording is in the public domain art criticism by walter savage landor from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin art criticism first bring me raphael who alone hath seen in all her purity heaven's virgin queen alone hath felt true beauty bring me then titian ennobler of the noblest men and next the sweet correggio nor chastise his little cupids for those wicked eyes i want not rubens pink puffy bloom nor rembrandt's glimmer in a dusty room with those and poussin's nymph frequented woods his templed heights and long-drawn solitudes i am content yet fain would look abroad on one warm sunset of orsonian claude end of poem this recording is in the public domain anne hathaway to the idol of my eye and delight of my heart anne hathaway by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter anne hathaway to the idol of my eye and delight of my heart anne hathaway footnote this poem has sometimes but without much reason been attributed to shakespeare End of footnote. would ye be taught ye feathered throng with love's sweet notes to grace your song to pierce the heart with thrilling lay listen to mine anne hathaway she hath a way to sing so clear phoebus might wandering stop to hear to melt the sad make blithe the gay and nature charm anne hath a way she hath a way anne hath a way to breathe delight anne hath a way when envy's breath and rancorous tooth do soil and bite fair worth and truth and merit to distress betray to soothe the heart and hath a way she hath a way to chase despair to heal all grief to cure all care turn foulest night to fairest day she knowest fond heart and hath a way she hath a way and hath a way to make grief bliss and hath a way talk not of gems the orient list the diamond topaz amethyst the emerald mild the ruby gay talk of my gem and hath a way she hath a way with her bright eye their various lustres to defy the jewels she and the foil they so sweet to look and hath a way she hath a way and hath a way to shame bright gems and hath a way but were it to my fancy given to rate her charms i'd call them heaven for though a mortal made of clay angels must love anne hathaway she hath a way so to control to rapture the imprisoned soul and sweetest heaven on earth display that to be heaven anne hath a way she hath a way and hath a way to be heaven's self and hath a way end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet's friend lord bolingbroke from an essay on man epistle four by alexander pope from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for LibriVox .org by Sonia. the poet's friend lord bolingbroke from an essay on man epistle four come then my friend my genius come along o master of the poet and the song 
and while the muse now stoops or now ascends to man's low passions or their glorious ends teach me like thee in various nature wise to fall with dignity with temper rise formed by thy converse happily to steer from grave to gay from lively to severe correct with spirit eloquent with ease intent to reason or polite to please o oh, while along the stream of time thy name expanded flies and gathers all its fame say shall my little bark attend and sail pursue the triumph and partake the gale when statesmen heroes kings in dust repose whose sons shall blush their fathers were thy foes shall then this verse to future age pretend thou wert my guide philosopher and friend that urged by thee i turned the tuneful art from sounds to things from fancy to the heart for wit's false mirror held up nature's light showed erring pride whatever is is right end of poem this recording is in the public domain a bard's epitaph by robert burns from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens a bard's epitaph is there a whim inspired fool o'er fast for thought o'er hot for rule o'er blat to seek o'er proud to snool let him draw nay and o'er this graspy heap sing dool and drap a tear is there a bard of rustic song who noteless steals the crowd among that weakly this area throng o oh, pass not by but with a threat of feeling strong here heave a sigh is there a man whose judgment clear can others teach the course to steer yet runs himself life's mad career wild as the wave here pause and through the starting tear survey this grave the poor inhabitant below was quick to learn and wise to know and keenly felt the friendly glow and sober flame but thoughtless follies laid him low and stained his name reader attend whether thy soul soars fancy's flights beyond the pole or darkly grubs this earthly hole in low pursuit no prudent cautious self-control is wisdom's root end of poem this recording is in the public domain Chopin by Emma Lazarus from the world's best poetry volume 7 descriptive and narrative part 1 read for librivox.org by thomas peter chopin 1 a dream of interlinking hands a feet tireless to spin the unseen fairy woof of the entangling vaults bright eye beams meet gay laughter echoes from the vaulted roof warm perfumes rise the soft unflickering glow of branching lights sets off the changeful charms of glancing gems rich stuffs the dazzling snow of necks unkerchiefed and bare clinging arms hark to the music how beneath the strain of reckless revelry vibrates and sobs one fundamental chord of constant pain the pulse beat of the poet's heart that throbs so yearns though all the dancing waves rejoice the troubled sea's disconsolate deep voice two who shall proclaim the golden fable false of orpheus miracles this subtle strain above our prose world's sordid loss and gain lightly uplifts us with the rhythmic waltz the lyric prelude the nocturnal song of love and languor varied visions rise that melt and blend to our enchanted eyes the polish poet who sleeps silenced long the seraph-souled musician 
breathes again eternal eloquence immortal pain revive the exalted face we know so well the illuminated eyes the fragile frame slowly consuming with its inward flame we stir not speak not lest we break the spell three a voice was needed sweet and true and fine as the sad spirit of the evening breeze throbbing with human passion yet divine as the wild bird's untutored melodies a voice for him neath twilight heavens and dim who mourneth for his dead while round him fall the wan and noiseless leaves a voice for him who sees the first green sprout who hears the call of the first robin on the first spring day a voice for all whom fate hath set apart who still misprized must perish by the way longing with love for that they lack the art of their own soul's expression for all these sing the unspoken hope the vague sad reveries four the nature shaped a poet's heart a lyre from out whose chords the slightest breeze that blows drew trembling music wakening sweet desire how shall she cherish him behold she throws this precious fragile treasure in the whirl of seething passions he is scourged and stung must dive in storm-vexed seas if but one pearl of art or beauty therefrom may be wrung no pure-browed pensive nymph his muse shall be an amazon of thought with sovereign eyes whose kiss was poison man-brained worldly wise inspired that elfin delicate harmony rich gain for us but with him is it well the poet who must sound earth heaven and hell end of poem this recording is in the public domain the prayer of agassiz by john greenleaf whittier from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part one read for LibriVox.org by sonia as the narrator and craig franklin as the master the prayer of agassiz on the isle of penny keys ringed about by sapphire seas fanned by breezes salt and cool stood the master with his school over sails that not in vain wooed the west wind's steady strain line of coast that low and far stretched its undulating bar wings aslant along the rim of the waves they stooped to skim rock and isle and glistening bay fell the beautiful white day said the master to the youth we have come in search of truth trying with uncertain key door by door of mystery we are reaching through his laws to the garment hem of cause him the endless unbegun the unnameable the one light of all our light the source life of life and force of force as with fingers of the blind we are groping here to find what the hieroglyphics mean of the unseen in the scene what the thought which underlies nature's masking and disguise what it is that hides beneath blight and bloom and birth and death by past efforts unavailing doubt and error loss and failing of our weakness made aware on the threshold of our task let us light and guidance ask let us pause in silent prayer then the master in his place bowed his head a little space and the leaves by soft air stirred lapse of wave and cry of bird left the solemn hush unbroken of that wordless prayer unspoken while its wish on earth unsaid rose to heaven interpreted as in life's best hours we hear by the spirit's finer ear his low voice within us thus the all-father heareth us and his holy ear we pain with our noisy words and vain 
not for him our violence storming at the gates of sense his the primal language his the eternal silences even the careless heart was moved and the doubting gave assent with a gesture reverent to the master well beloved as thin mists are glorified by the light they cannot hide all who gaze upon him saw through its veil of tender awe how his face was still uplit by the old sweet look of it hopeful trustful full of cheer and the love that casts out fear who the secret may declare of that brief unuttered prayer did the shade before him come of the inevitable doom of the end of earth so near and eternity's new year in the lap of sheltering seas rests the isle of Penikes, but the lord of the domain comes not to his own again where the eyes that follow fail on a vaster sea his sail drifts beyond our beck and hail other lips within its bound shall the laws of life expound other eyes from rock and shell read the world's old riddles well but when breezes light and bland blow from summer's blossomed land when the air is glad with wings and the blithe song sparrow sings many an eye with his still face shall the living ones displace many an ear the word shall seek he alone could fitly speak and one name forevermore shall be uttered over and over by the waves that kiss the shore by the curlew's whistle sent down the cool sea-scented air in all voices known to her nature own her worshipper half in triumph half lament thither love shall tearful turn friendship pause uncovered there and the wisest reverence learn from the master's silent prayer end of poem this recording is in the public domain Cain died February 16, 1857, by Fitz James O'Brien, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Cain died February 16, 1857. Aloft upon old Balsatic Crag, which, scalped by keen winds that defend the pole, gazes with dead face on the seas that roll around the secret of the mystic zone, a mighty nation's star-bespangled flag flutters alone, and underneath, upon the lifeless front of that drear cliff, a simple name is traced. Fit type of him who, famishing and gaunt, but with a rocky purpose in his soul, breasted the gathering snows, clung to the drifting flows by want beleaguered and by winter chased seeking the brother lost amid that frozen waste not many months ago we greeted him crowned with the icy honors of the north across the land his hard-won fame went forth and maine's deep woods were shaken limb by limb his own mild keystone state sedate and prim burst from decorous quiet as he came hot southern lips with eloquence of flame sounded in triumph texas wild and grim proffered its horny hand the large-lunged west out from his giant breast yelled its frank welcome and from main to main jubilant to the sky thundered the mighty cry honor to cain in vain in vain beneath his feet we flung the reddening roses all in vain we poured the golden wine and round the shining board sent the toast circling till the rafters rung with the thrice tripled honors of the feast scarce the buds wilted and the voices ceased ere the pure light that sparkled in his eyes bright as auroral fires in southern skies faded and faded and the brave young heart that the relentless arctic winds had robbed of all its vital heat in that long quest for the lost captain now within his breast more and more faintly throbbed his was the victory but as his grasp closed on the laurel crown with eager clasp death launched a whistling dart 
and ere the thunders of applause were done his bright eyes closed for ever on the sun too late too late the splendid prize he won in the olympic race of science and of art like to some shattered berg that pale and lone drifts from the white north to a tropic zone and in the burning day wastes peak by peak away till on some rosy even it dies with sunlight blessing it so he tranquilly floated to a southern sea and melted into heaven he needs no tears who lived a noble life we will not weep for him who died so well but we will gather round the hearth and tell the story of his strife such homage suits him well better than a funeral pomp or passing bell what tale of peril and self-sacrifice prisoned amid the fastness of ice with hunger howling o'er the wastes of snow night lengthening into months the ravenous flow crunching the massive ships as the white bear crunches his prey the insufficient share of loathsome food the lethargy of famine the despair urging to labor nervelessly pursued toil done with skinny arms and faces hewed like pallid masks while dolefully behind glimmered the fading embers of a mind that awful hour when through the prostrate band delirium stalked laying his burning hand upon the ghastly foreheads of the crew the whispers of rebellion faint and few at first but deepening ever till they grew into black thoughts of murder such the throng of horrors found the hero high the song should be that hymns the noble part he played sinking himself yet ministering aid to all around him by a mighty will living defiant of the wants that kill because his death would seal his comrade's fate cheering with ceaseless and inventive skill those polar waters dark and desolate equal to every trial every fate he stands until spring tardy with relief unlocks the icy gate and the pale prisoners thread the world once more to the steep cliffs of greenland's pastoral shore bearing their dying chief time was when he should gain his spurs of gold from royal hands who wooed the knightly state the knell of old formalities is told and the world's knights are now self-consecrate no grander episode doth chivalry hold in all its annals back to charlemagne than that lone vigil of unceasing gain faithfully kept through hunger and through cold by the good christian knight alicia kane fitz james o'brien end of poem this recording is in the public domain End of The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 1